So welcome everyone to this um, this first workshop. I am so, so stoked to have you guys here. Bear with us if there's any sort of tech issues or things like that. If we have any uh, thing like that going on, just bear with us guys. This is the first time we have ever done that. Otherwise, welcome to you all. Thank you so much for being here. I, as always, am Bodhi, the unexceptional Dungeon Master, and am stoked to be joined by Matt, my faithful friend, my incredible Dungeon Master from Morton Magic. Uh, go ahead, Matt. Fucking say hi to people. Yeah, hi, folks. So as Bodhi says, I'm Matt. Uh, I am the Dungeon Master over at Morton Magic, uh, where we are on campaign two of our homebrew campaign. Um, very, very, very happy that Bodhi and Tom have joined us as new members of the Morton Magic family. Um, over the last few weeks and months, it's been a crazy journey, uh, but it's been awesome. Uh, so yes, very excited to be here as well. As I was saying just before we sort of kicked off the recording there, this is my first time doing anything, DM workshops, sort of things like that. So bear with us. Um, I am by no means a Dungeon Master expert or a D&D expert. We've just got some considerable experience over a few years of, uh, of DMing. So no, really happy to be here. Exactly. And on top of that, uh, you, you'll be thankful because I've gone into the depths of the internet and done research because I also don't know everything, but have done research for you guys to bring some extra special tips and tricks to our workshop today. So just a quick running order of things so everyone knows exactly what it, they are to expect for the evening. So um, we will be doing me and Matt's intros. Um, then we'll be setting some ground rules for the workshop across the board. Then what I'm going to do is give each of you an opportunity to come and introduce yourself to the group, uh, talk a little bit about your D&D experience and some stuff that you love about D&D slash uh, RP, uh, TTRPGs. Um, and then from there, we will dive into the meat of this workshop, begin kind of talking about some of these, uh, these tips and tricks, tools that Matt and I use and things that we've found out on the internet to, to kind of give you guys. Um, about halfway through the advice section, we will be running a little activity where we will split you guys into groups um, for you guys to get creative, get your minds into a fun space and begin kind of uh, working on some cool stuff. After that, you guys will get a chance to present those super sick, awesome ideas to the group and share what you guys have done, which I'm super excited about. Um, and then after that, we'll have a couple more little tips and tricks before finally rounding this out, thanking you guys for taking the time, um, giving you guys the jot form, the anonymous feedback form that you guys can fill out about the workshop itself, which would be super helpful if you guys did. It means that we can get better, make this experience even better for you guys as we go. And then finally as well, I'll be giving you guys a handout with all the information that Matt and I have spoken about tonight so that you guys can take it away with you and never forget the things we've talked about because they are vital. They are exceedingly ex important. Um, cool. So let's, uh, let's dive in with some intros. Um, I will go first. Uh, my name is Bodhi, uh, Bodhi Camboris. I am the dungeon master over at Homie and the Dude. I'm also the, was the lead writer of Sky Zephyrs, our, our first major supplement that we wrote, which is all about ve vehicle combat in D&D 5e. Um, and I have been DMing for coming up to three years now. Um, it is truly my passion in life. I didn't know what my passion was until I sat down at the DM table and realized that this is the thing that I love more than anything in the world, except for my partner of course, um, and, uh, and... Brownie points for that one, mate, brownie points for that. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to say, I love TTRPGs because I'm a big movie buff. Um, you know, I love television, movies, you know, cinema, anime, and I have to say that D&D &D and TTRPGs feels like one of the best methods of storytelling in the world. It feels super organic, super fresh, and it can be so detailed. So... That is why I truly love uh, TTRPGs and have found myself in this space. I'll hand over now to my partner in crime, Matt, tonight. Matt, give us a little bit about your D&D &D experience and why you kind of found your love for TTRPGs. 
Yeah, so as I said, and as we've already sort of said at the beginning, I'm Matt. Uh, so I am the DM for Malt and Magic, which is a fully homebrewed 5th edition D&D &D, um, live stream that takes place on a Monday at 7.30pm UK time. Um, and that really was the birth of my D&D journey as well. Um, we used to do uh, a whiskey and poker night amongst my close group of friends. And there was one, one night where we decided, you know what, let's do something different and let's try ttrpg now i had played some D, D when i was at college some three and a half edition or 3.5e um not got into it too heavily but did a lot of research for that initial initial session um and everybody got really into it and then covid hit and we needed something to do to just keep connected and stay in touch so myself danny and dave who are my uh, sort of uh, core co-stars and uh, were back then at least um we just started playing on teams of all things and and just running a little we ran the lost minds of fandelva for example is the first thing we ever did um i'd never picked up the dm's guide uh still haven't read it sorry <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but uh i've sort of dipped into it here and there and yeah we are now what three years three and a bit years down the line um so i now not only dm for that campaign but also with some of my work colleagues i dm a couple of campaigns there one of which is homebrewed one of which is we are doing uh, the dragon of ice by a peak um but i love it it is i uh, like birdie says absolutely one of my favorite things to do i love storytelling through that i am a massive massive sci-fi and fantasy nerd um we talked a little bit around sort of where we get our inspiration from and in campaign one i have my favorite book series became the uh inspiration for the realm of death in the world for example um which is the old kingdom trilogy in the old kingdom series if anybody's familiar with those books but that's my journey um very much a forever dm love it don't see me doing anything else for a long time in that front. Still love to play as well, but I just love creating the stories and love creating the worlds. So it's a lot of fun. Just wait till I can get you in one of my games, Matt. Just you wait. Oh, <laughs> so looking forward to that. So looking forward to that. Um, cool, guys. So a couple of things that I just wanted to mention. Some ground rules for tonight's um, workshop because we want to just make sure a little session zero guys for tonight's workshop super important all you gms out there you know what i'm talking about little session zero for us so the first ground rule is respect matt and myself if you come in to talk or uh, or do anything like that please be respectful to matt and myself you know this is not a pg workshop you know with that being said my second rule is that this um this may uh, be uh, there may be some adult language there may be some things like that involved um, so bear that in mind but please come in be respectful to Matt and myself you know we're putting this on in our spare time so that we can hopefully uh, spread love and and the word of Dungeons and Dragons to you people out there as world uh, in the world as well as that the next rule is please respect each other there will be a section of this workshop where you will get to work in groups together and we would very much appreciate if you guys respected each other now that comes with do not bash any ideas that someone comes up with work together and compromise guys communication is super super important so make sure that that is something that you guys are doing when we do put you into groups because we do not want anyone feeling uncomfortable, um, upset, or, or belittled in those group situations. So please be mindful of that. Now, this one is one that probably a lot of you are familiar with. The X card is very much in play tonight. Um, the X card is very much in play. If there is at any moment where you feel uncomfortable about a topic that is being discussed, whether that is in your individual breakout groups that we do later in the activity or during the workshop itself, please drop a big X in the chat. Let us know that you're not comfortable with what we're talking about. And we will quickly do exactly as we do during TTRPG games. We will rewind and talk about something else and move on so that everyone feels comfortable with this workshop and this session. With that being said as well, we are recording this workshop and session. So anyone who does come up and speak, you will be recorded. So if you are uncomfortable with that, feel free to just sit some of the activities out, sit little bits and bobs out. That is totally fine and understandable as well. We do not want anyone to feel pressured to do any of that as well. The final thing that I will say 
is we want this to be as interactive as possible. So there will be many moments where we will be asking for examples from yourself. We will be offering you guys a chance to ask any sort of questions that you might want to do. Um, so please, please, please use that request to speak button if you have something that you want to chime in with or a question that you want to ask or an example, for example, that you want to give. Ha ha, an example for an, an example that you want to give. Um, so that is the ground rules for everyone. If you are 100% okay with those ground rules, can we please get some thumbs up in the chat from everyone, um, please? Just wanna make sure that everyone's kind of signing off on all of that good stuff. So if you could just drop a little thumb up in the chat um, to let us know that you are cool with all of that, we would very much appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. Look at all you amazing people. Look at all of this. Just absolutely dropping in, doing all of that. We love it. Appreciate that, guys. Thank you so, so much. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I think that is everyone. Thank you guys so, so much for that. I really appreciate that. Awesome. Okay. Now we are going to hand over to you guys because part of this is interaction. This is about us getting to know each other. So um, for those of you who wish to introduce yourself to the group and you're going to get about one minute to talk, you're going to get one minute to tell us what is your D&D &D experience, um, as in your experience at the D&D &D table, how long you've been doing it and such like that, as well as also why you love TTRPGs, please request to speak now and I will invite you in one at a time to do so. So if you want to introduce yourself to the group, please request to speak. Awesome. Yeah, we've got two people already, three people, four people. Beautiful. Four people. Look at that. Amazing. Awesome. Yeah, five. Beautiful. Thank you guys for all of you just hopping into that. Love it. Let's start off with Tom, the co-founder of Homie and the Dude, my father. Let's start off with you, Tom. How about that? I'll invite you in to speak now quickly. Um, you should get that. Come on in. You're on mute, Tom. Just make sure that you're unmuted and give people, you got a minute starting now. Go. Oh, thanks. No pressure. <laughs> uh, I feel like I also got the inside track for being selected first. So either that or I've been like, you want to get me out of the way first, which is fine. Um, but OK, so quickly, my experience with D&D is mostly around just our family game that we started around three years ago. When Bodhi said he started three years ago, it was concurrent with that. And we also started with The Lost Minds of Found Delver and then quickly moved on to um, homebrew play and I, I actually dm'd once and i actually uh, don't have any interest in dming but i do have interest in dynamic exciting fast-paced immersive combat because i enjoy it most when it is like that and it's probably the least part of my D, &D uh love when it isn't like that when it's stagnated when it's really um, clunky when everyone is taking too much time per per turn that that kind of takes kind of kills the vibe for me. So that's the reason I'm here. Um, I, I love D&D &D mostly because I love RP and I love really sinking into um, losing myself into a character. And that's that's the thing that I think is magical in the, in the storytelling of D&D. &D. Amazing. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, it was, yeah, sure. Yeah, dead, dead on. <laughs> exactly dead on. Perfect. Nailed, <laughs> absolutely nailed it. Right, I'm going to drop you back into the audience. Let's grab another member out quickly. Let's do that. Right, okay, next up we are going to have, um, I'm not entirely sure what your name is simply because I've got the streamer mode on, uh, but we've got A, I assume Awesome, Awesome uh, Go? Please introduce yourself to everyone. Yeah, Awesome Go. Um, so yeah, I'm Awesome Go, I, or known as Damien, I don't mind both. Um, yeah, I started playing D&D &D about three years ago probably, started DMing about a half a year into playing, and been DMing ever since. So started off learning just ground rules by being a player and then mm -hmm. slowly going into more of the DM side. And now I have my weekly Amazing. games. Hell yeah. Keep going. Sorry. Keep going. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, yeah, I'm no, loving it. Keep going. Keep going. Not it. <laughs> Amazing. Why do you love D&D? &D? What's, what's, why, why have you fallen in love with this hobby? What's, what's, what's made you fall uh, in love with it? Yeah, I love fantasy and I love RPGs, so it kind of... Natural went fit. uh pretty yeah natural fit amazing hell yeah dude that is awesome thank you so much for sharing that i really appreciate you jumping in i'm gonna send you back down to the audience i'm gonna grab someone else thank you for sharing that. Right. i really appreciate that dude awesome right Cheers. Here you go. right next up we are gonna go with we're gonna go with drake let's get drake up in here drake i've invited you to come and speak come hop in 
you are up, buddy. Go. Up, oh, I'm Drake. Um, I say I'm also British. Uh, going to D and D a couple years pre-COVID. Started DMing two months before COVID. Nice. Had a campaign die because of the effects of COVID and overall exhaustion. Uh, like D and D because of it's a good escape escape temp from reality because don't have the best mental health and also um good creative thing. And at the moment, I am mainly a homebrew maker. <laughs> Because I spend a lot of my time making homebrew, uh, usually inspired by Japanese media, specifically Super Sentai, Kamen Rider, and Ultraman. Um, you, some balance needed for a lot of them, because I don't know how to balance stuff, and I don't have any players to balance them with. Oh, hey, I thank you. I've a few homebrews in the, um, in <laughs> in the, the server uh... already. Hell yeah, your homebrews nice. are incredible. Thank you for partaking in the server so much, Drake. It was a pleasure to meet you the other day when we chatted. So I knew a little bit about Drake. I was I was playing possum over here. I knew a little bit about Drake. But Drake, thank you so much, dude, for sharing all that. I'm going to send you back down to the audience and I'm going to grab someone else. How's that sound? That's awesome. Nice. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, buddy. Right, okay. Next up, I actually don't know what your name is based on the fact that, like I said, I've got this little uh, this stream block thing, but you are invited in now. Um, I do not know what your username is. Go for it. Hi, uh, my username is Beutelmaus, which is German for wombat. Uh, Ooh. And uh, I'm in Los Angeles. I've been playing D&D since 1979. Wow. Uh, I've been DMing and playing the entire time since then. Uh, I'm currently playing with uh, a group that we've been together since about 1990. Um, uh, you know, in different incarnations, we've played uh, Rollmaster uh, in addition to D&D. Our D&D was AD&D. Uh, up until we switched to 5e, um, which was right uh, about when COVID hit. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been playing online since then. Uh, mostly I've played with uh, these small groups and mostly homebrew things. But uh, lately, uh, since the end of COVID, uh, I've been doing a lot of Adventurers League, which I, it's, it's not my favorite, but... Uh, as a change of pace and going in and playing in a weekend in 13 different games uh, and not having a lot of strings attached and things can be a lot of fun. Uh, and I came to a lot of this through war games. And uh, so combat is of interest to me for that. Uh, awesome. I think it's uh, quite odd. The the D and D rules seem, uh, you know, oddly unrealistic but you know the point is role playing and some other things too uh so i'm really curious to see or hear what everyone has to say and by the way i i found you guys through your post uh on nations and canons oh yeah um and i just want to thank you for that um because it's it's good those guys are are great uh i uh, they're friends of a friend and uh i don't know them but uh it's a very interesting thing for me. I do reenactments amongst them, colonial reenacting. Awesome. Um, and so there's a lot of connections in there with combat and role playing and years of history of wasting my time at a gaming table. <laughs> hey, so, it's never yeah. wasted time. It is never wasted time. And hey, thank you for being a part of this. I appreciate a veteran in the workshop. That is awesome. You are an absolute badass, a vet of D&D &D since the outset. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for that intro. And I'm going to drop you back down into yours and grab someone else. But thank you so much, man. I very much appreciate that. Right. Moving you down. Beautiful. Right. Next up, we are going to grab Chaotic. Let's grab Chaotic. I have invited you to come and speak, Chaotic. Hi, my name's Chaotic. I, my pronouns are he, they, and I've been playing tabletop role-playing games uh, since 2011. Uh, I've run quite a few games. Uh, uh, it's been a while since I've played D&D &D specifically. Uh, it uh, combat has always confused me a little bit. Uh, I don't know how to balance that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm looking forward to, like, seeing, like, what other people have to say about the matter. Hell yeah. That's awesome. I, I, I'm super stoked to have you in the chat. What, what made you fall in love with TTRPGs? What, why have you just kept coming back to this space? 
Uh, it's uh, there is very little you can't do in a tabletop mm. role playing game. Uh, there is so many ideas and so many like creative outlets with it that it just you could pretty much do anything, and that that that's just magical. One hundred percent. That is a great answer. I love that answer. That's a phenomenal one. And I am so stoked here to have you here. I hope we can help you with some combat stuff. Uh, we might get into some balancing bits and bobs. So please feel free to fire away some questions if you have anything throughout um, the the session. I'm going to drop you back down into the audience. But thank you, Chaotic. I really, really appreciate that. Right. Sending you back now. Right. Next person up. We've got Mad Maven up next. You have been invited to come and talk. Come on in. Hi. So I'm on the opposite coast in the United States. I live in New York State, and I have wanted to play D&D since the late 70s, and I've been playing for four months. <laughs> so. awesome. oh, amazing. Amazing. We love, we love yeah. a new player. That is incredible. And what, so what about it in the past when you wanted to play it and now versus you actually playing it? You know, what, what was the reason that you were so keen to get involved? When I was a kid, it was the people, the, the few kids in the neighborhood I knew that played it. Mm -hmm. But since I was a girl, you know, I was never really encouraged to mm. do any of that, that type of stuff. And I am just thoroughly looking forward to every Wednesday night now. Yeah, I know, but it's times have changed because Truth. every single week that we play, I feel like I have no clue what I'm doing. And this is the most patient, most gracious, most caring, compassionate, giving group of people. They're like, don't worry just come along for the ride. We've got you. We'll help you figure this out. And I'm having the absolute time of my life. Oh, I think we. Oh, should we? Should we let people into onto the secret there, Bodhi? Go on. Go nobody. On. Kno nobody knows what they're doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Everybody's making it up on the spot. So no, I am glad you have found your little community there as well, Maven. That sounds amazing. Oh, just the most wholesome answer. Oh my goodness, my little heart is just beating so fast over here. I'm so stoked that you found this community in a place that feels comfortable and right for you. That is so, so awesome. And I can't wait to have you join the homie and the dude familia and and, and you are more than welcome um, in our space. We're, we're stoked to have you. Um, right, I'm gonna drop you back down into the audience and grab someone else. Thank you so much for your intro. I really, really appreciate that. Right. Thank you for having me. No That's problem at all. Um, amazing. Oh, they did it themselves. I didn't even have to do it. Look, look, look at that. Doesn't know D&D, but is smashing me with Discord. And last, but in no way least, I do not know your username because it is currently censored for me because I am recording, but you have been invited in. Come on in. Come let us know uh, about yourself. Hey there. Uh, so I go by Celtic Knot on pretty much everywhere on the internet. Um, I have been playing D and D for about three or four years. My husband got me into it, um, and I uh, started playing with uh, with a group he was in. He's now currently DMing that group. Um, we're running a homebrew awesome. campaign there. Uh, I'm also playing in a uh, in a Exandria based campaign that started out as Call of the Netherdeep. Um, so my profile Ooh. picture is actually my character for that. Um, and uh, yeah, I have. Very little DM experience. I've uh, I've run a couple of one shots, but I'm planning a couple of uh, long term campaigns. One of which is a homebrew, and one of which is set in Alexandria. Um, so uh, I am, you know, looking forward to to seeing what I can learn here. Um, I am. So I, I've become like completely obsessed with D and D over the last couple of years. I love telling <laughs> stories and telling it in a, in a collaborative way like this. Um, being able to uh, bounce off of other people's ideas and characters is just the most ridiculous fun I think I've ever had. That is, you're 100% you're correct. I fully, fully agree with you. And I love that you're looking to take that leap into DMing. It's a scary leap, but hey, we have the most fun in life when we're leaping into the unknown. So I take my hat off to you for that one. 
literally well done and that is absolutely awesome uh, i think that is badass and uh and and super super proud to hear someone kind of diving into that space because it can be scary it can be daunting um, and I hope you learned some amazing stuff tonight, uh, but please feel free to ask lots of questions. And also just for people who are out there um, listening, we are making this, this is gonna be helpful for players and for GMs. It's gonna help everybody out tonight. So that is a big thing to mention that I didn't mention earlier that I, I, I will do now. Thank you so much. I'm gonna drop you back into the audience. Thank you so much for that intro. I really, really appreciate that. Right, guys. Wow, what an awesome group we have tonight, Matt. What a, are, aren't we the luckiest two in the whole world? Absolutely, absolutely. I love those stories as well. Loved all the. There's so much, so much variety in there. Yeah. Not just people who are like brand new to the game. People who've been playing the game for years. People who have wanted to play the game and are now diving in. Love all of that. It is. It's amazing. Me uh, too. I think it's amazing to see how much D and D brings people together as well. It's awesome. Fully, fully agree. Right. Incredible. Right. Let's dive into some of our advice. Let's start talking. Let's get let's start giving these people the meat, Matt. Let's start giving them the stuff that they've been that they've been waiting all week to to hear about and all this questions and stuff that they want to ask. Absolutely. Hell yeah. So the first thing that we are going to talk to you guys about today that is going to enhance your combat is thinking about monster motivations and the motivations of the monsters that you include in your combat encounters. Now, you might think that's a super simple thing, but actually when you dive into it, it can become a little bit more complicated and it can be something that you have to actually put a little bit of time into thinking about. Um, I would actually say Matt is very good at this as a dungeon master. Often I find myself going, wow, you know, these creatures had a purpose. Like they were, they were making decisions and they had an objective in the combat in the same way that we had an, an objective in the combat. Blah, blah, blah. There we go. Um, so, um, Matt, uh, do you want to kick us off? Do you want to talk about the first point, the, the one that I think is one of the most pertinent points of this whole thing? Yeah, so I think one of the things we wanted to talk about is is really think about the monsters just not there to fight fight the heroes. I think we've sort of talked about that a little bit. Um, monsters, realistically, creatures, and there's a bit of a distinction there as well, which we'll touch on. Um, but they exist in different parts of your world, of this world. And you need to think about the why for that. So why is this particular monster in this particular area? One of the big things that I see used quite a lot are random encounter tables. There's nothing wrong with a random encounter table, but just make it relevant to that area. Mm -hmm. Think about the location. Um, they have a purpose. They could have, I mean, you could go really deep if you really wanted to, depending on your character lore and your monster lore here, and go deep into the history of that particular region around these monsters and these creatures. Um, let's talk about that difference as well, shall we, Bode? The difference between creatures and monsters. Oh, I have, I have such, a, such a gripe with WotC for doing what they've done to the yeah. monster manual, as if we're gonna call it, that all these things in this book are monsters, that they're monstrous and mean and, and oh, I, I hate that. I'm actually, I'm like the biggest hater of that in the whole world. I advocate for these creatures are creatures. They are things just like NPCs in your world, just like a common squirrel that are existing and trying to just be part of the world in the way that they have existed since, you know, the creation of, of your you know, universe, your world, basically. So for me, I am such a fan of calling things creatures as opposed to monsters because it really, it feels like at times if we're going with monsters, then surely they need to be mean and angry and all the time. But really, that's not always the case and i think that's a really important distinction to make between a monster and a creature um creatures and monsters are living breathing things in your world guys this is something that is so so important they exist just like the npcs and that is something that you need to be considering when you are planning these combat encounters like matt said why are they here you know what are their motivations for you know engaging in this combat with your players and things like that so actually i wanted to throw out to the chat you guys are welcome to request to speak if you'd like to but i'm also happy for you to just type in the chat if you'd wish 
What are some examples of maybe motivations that a monster or a creature would have for being in a location? Do you guys have um, anything uh, uh, kind of in your thought process? Drake wants to hop in and speak. Let's get Drake right, in here to give it. us some mo some creature motivations for why they might be in a location. Come on in, Drake. For me, like how I plan encounters, I always look at where, the, like, reason why the party's going where they are. Like, mm -hmm. in my current campaign, they're on, like, they're on the final island. They're literally trying to get to the big boss. So every encounter I have with them is okay. They're fighting these creatures because they are literally blocking the path. And mm. like, my last encounter was a bunch of cultists. So I went, okay, cultists. They're part of the main villain's cult. They're trying to stop people from ending the cult and basically stopping the end of the world. Uh, mm. But if it's like a random creature which I've done in the past, it's okay, why are they attacking it? If the mm. creature, like uh, say a uh, tiger or something, it's okay, enters its habitat, it's feeling threatened, it's just make sure, trying to set its own ground and if I doesn't listen to its warnings in its own way, it will attack. Mm. It's very much the, I use animal instincts that I've, ironically enough, accidentally studied. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Amazing. I go from there. I look at I look at the instincts of creatures and go, okay, how would they react to certain things? I love that. I absolutely love that. Thank you for that insight, Drake. I really, really appreciate that. I'm gonna drop you back down into the audience. I really, really appreciate that. Um, and we'll we'll touch on a, a really important point as well. Though, yeah. Around go, that. Go for it, man. Um, the, the, yeah, that you sort of talked around it that. That creature exists there and has their habitat and their their lifestyle, so to speak. And that doesn't just have to be the simple wildlife as well. It's in one of the later uh, Watsy books, one of the later official materials, where they finally talk around, uh, I think it's the motivations for Cyclops as an example there. And we're talking... What, what, last year, 2019, I think it was? Uh, sorry, not 2019. God, where's my brain at? Maths. <laughs> yeah, and I'm a DM. I should be able to do maths. Uh, sorry, so, like, we're talking 2022, 2023, where that book comes out. I can't remember which exactly when it is, but it's the first time where they say, like, if you're interacting with these Cyclops, Cyclops I, whatever the plural of Cyclops is, um, this is what some of their motivations are going to be. This is how you could interact with those creatures doesn't always have to be a fight does it so mm. that's really really important to think about so really 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 uh, pleased that you raised that drake i i fully agree i think you know the the idea that you know just because you happen upon something doesn't mean it's role initiative let's let's go beat this thing into submission and move on with our life um but let's talk about when you do engage in combat with a creature or a monster and tom i'm going to bring you up in just a second um, but I want to quickly just touch on the fact that when you do have creatures or monsters engage in a combat, I would consider what are their motivations during the combat. Specifically, you know, what are they thinking about during the combat? What are these creatures trying to achieve by fighting or engaging in this combat with the players? Are they trying to defend their territory? Are they trying to, you know, possibly protect something that is nearby, that is special to them? Are they trying to stop you from passing because this is a restricted place that you're not welcome in? There's lots of reasons why a combat might ensue with creatures, but it's important for you as the GM to understand why that is and why they're engaging that. Because then it will also let you understand how quickly those creatures decide to not engage in that combat any further. Whether that means, you know, you're getting a creature down to, you know, very little health or, you know, very little things like that. And then you want to, uh, you want to basically have them be like, oh, okay, well, I'm done. I don't want to die. So I'm actually going to get out of here. You know, that's an important thing to consider as well. I'm going to let Tom in and see what uh, what, the, what the big man has to say, because I'm sure he's got a great bit of insight for us. And then I'm going to address what Chaotic just said in the chat, because that's awesome as well. Um, Tom, you have been invited in. Come on in, homie. Thanks. Yeah, just, just kind of positioning it the way you guys did makes me think differently as a player. If I'm thinking that a creature or whatever the, the entity is that we're coming up against in combat is, is multi-dimensional, multi-faceted in their personality. And it gives me more opportunities than just to think, 
all right, we're rolling initiative, and then I got to get ready for combat. I can I can approach this differently. I can look for potential vulnerabilities that they have, potential common ground that we have, different ways that we can kind of deepen that experience of combat. It doesn't just have to be us bashing each other until you know whoever has the most um, the most points kind of goes on from there. So you you just kind of made the penny drop for me in thinking how I would approach a combat differently. Looking at those creatures as, as you know, they're 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 like um, well-rounded. They have they have different elements of personalities, just like the rest of us do. And maybe approaching that, exploring that, probing that is something that I'll think about. How yeah. Absolutely, I, I love that. That goes to what Chaotic said in the chat there around most of the creatures in the monster manual, they're sentient. Um, so what is their personality? What's that dimension that they've got? Um, now that as a DM allows you to have like inter-creature party play as well um think of uh, a group of orcs and the run to the litter if you like they're going to feel a bit differently maybe they don't want to fight um mm. we had this situation mm. in campaign one where a group of hobgoblins had turned on one of the members and lo and behold that hobgoblin then was adopted by the party and ended up being the glue of the party so yeah that idea of personality and multi-dimensional creature, as you've, you've called it there, Tom, allows for the players to explore a little bit more than just, I've got a sharp stick, I'm going to hit it in the face. Yeah, 100% agree. 100% agree. agree. Tom, I'm going to drop you back into the audience. Thank you for that insight. That was awesome. And shout out to Chaotic as well. You're, you're super right. Yeah. The sentient point is super important. That's a really really important point to my creature versus monster kind of conversation that we were having a minute ago. So I, I really appreciate you dropping that insight into the chat, Chaotic. Awesome job with that. The final thing that I want to bring up about this whole thing is there's also something beautiful that you guys can use as a weapon in your arsenal as a dungeon master. And this is one of my favorite ones. I love moral questions. I love making a party think about their actions. I love them debating whether they should do something based on the morality of a situation and the options that they have laid out in front of them. I wanted to give you guys an example, one that is one of my favorite examples, and it's a common one that I think a lot of us are familiar with. But it's essentially, if you had a party of players that are tasked with capturing a thief, that keeps, keeps bringing down this establishment. They keep stealing the goods from this establishment and they just keep doing it. It's a bother. The shop owner has had enough. His shop is going under. He's going to lose his shop because his goods are being stolen and he has nothing to sell. Now your party go after this thief. They go after it and they hunt them down only to find out that the thief is just trying to feed their family of adopted, you know, whatever it might be, you know, uh, in, in whatever method that is. But they're just trying to feed their family. Now you sit there as players and you go, does the shop owner have the, you know, the, the, the moral, I guess, high ground? Or is the thief really just trying to survive? And do they have the moral high ground? And then you start going, cool. Are we going to go back to the shop owner and explain what's happening and try and come to some sort of compromise here? Are we still going to fight the thief and take what doesn't belong to them because the law is the law and that's how this works? Or are you going to take pity on the thieves, let them go, but warn them to never go back to that shop ever again? There's also a hundred more options that you could as players take in that moment, but it's a great example of that moral question of, You've got someone doing something and they have an objective. They have, you know, a motivation. That motivation has annoyed someone else and you've been tasked to deal with it. Now it's up for you to decide where you set, sit on that kind of moral spectrum of things going on. Do you have anything you want to add about that, Matt? Um, do I have anything I want to add about that? Uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a funny example I've got, which... Um... It's a really left field example, actually, and then I am just going to have to jump off quickly because I think one of my uh, my daughters is uh, just playing up a little bit. But um, so one of the funniest examples I ever came across was uh, a group uh, or a party of adventurers that went after a hag because the hag was seen to be stealing children, um, mm -hmm. as hags do. It's fairly stereotypical. So kill the hag. I need to realise that the children are a lot happier and the children were from 
homes where it wasn't suitable for them. If anything, the hag was actually treating them better than their current uh, foster parents, parents, wards, uh, or sort of, yeah, the people that were meant to be looking after them. Um, so yeah, there's, there's those moral quandaries where you can take a stereotypical evil creature or supposedly evil creature and twist that personality slightly and create those moral quandaries within that as well. So it's great. Um, yeah. Forgive me, folks. I will be back as soon no, as I can be. I won't be too long. No worries, man. It's all good. I, I, I'll grab the helm quickly. Oh, let me yeah. just take this ship from <laughs> you one second. Um, so, guys, uh, that is kind of going to sum up our little talk about monster motivation. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to raise a hand or drop something in the chat. Um, I love what Drake's just said, talking about one of the moral questions that they're currently running um, in their game. I love that. Tom's talking about one that we had in one of our campaigns where there was a, a little gremlin that was kind of like seen as a bad guy and the rest of the party reflexively wanted to uh, burn him at the stake. And Tom was like, whoa, whoa like that's like what are the core values of our group as adventurers like what what are we here to do guys like geez that feels a bit you know intense and i you know i love i love uh both of those examples that were dropped in the chat um very nicely done guys um so quickly before we move on does anyone have any questions or anything that they would like to add before i do just quickly move on to our next kind of topic of combat uh and and tip and trick here i can see Tiger Beacon typing in the chat. I can see Chaotic typing in the chat. I can see Tom typing in the chat. Come on, guys. Give me your questions. Give me your stuff. I want to hear all about it. Uh, Mick offered uh, his intro into the chat. I saw that, Tom. I, I saw that Mick is actually driving. So Mick was one of the people that was originally listening, saying driving can't respond, but I'm 63 years old. Played D&D &D since 1980. Long break until my son and his friends picked up 5e. Been a forever DM since then. Currently on hiatus from 5e, but actually getting into playing Call of Cthulhu. That's awesome. Absolutely love that. Uh, Tiger Beacon saying, can these insights of the creature's motivations be found during combat um, and used as an alt win condition? Um, I assume what you mean like, is there a way for you know players to discover what these motivations are, discover what they're doing and things like that? I would say Tiger Beacon, 100% you can discover this stuff, um, you know, and work your way around just hitting something to, to, to get to the answer. Of course, talk to them. Like in any situation in life when you, there's a misunderstanding between two people or two creatures or two NPCs or a player and an NPC or whatever, communication is the biggest thing. You know, you could stop, hey, what's going on here? Try and communicate with them. If it's cast, speak with animals. Cast, speak with animals. And if you don't have that option, there's always passive options of how to avoid that. You know, shooing them away, trying to, you know, like with a bear, be big and threatening and trying to, you know, scare them off so that you don't have to engage in the combat and things like that. So I fully, fully feel like there's many ways that you can be, you know, engaging in that. And I would often say communication is like first port of call. Ask it questions. You know, ask it something, you know, that is, you know, it, it, you know, ask it uh, why it's here, why it's doing what it's doing. Why are you fighting us? We've simply come to talk to you and why, why are you trying to fight us, you know? Um, and, and, and kind of get into that a little bit. Um, Tiger Beacon with a follow-up question that I think is really, really good. I'm going to quickly just look at some of the other stuff in here. Um, and even in Void Combat, pull them in as an unlikely ally, says Tom. Yep, love that. Drake saying the Mass Effect method. Not everything needs to be a fight. 100% Drake. Uh, Chaotic saying moral questions aren't something that has come up in my game as the PCs have specific goal in mind um, and the other uh, with the other creatures in the game. Interesting. Well, hey, it's never too late for that to happen. It's never too late for one of these moral questions to come up. And you never know, Chaotic, your actions may have already caused consequences that have left moral questions that you are yet to face, that are yet to come up, that you're yet to re-encounter. So you don't know, those might be coming back around to bite you in the butt. You never, never know. Um, Tiger Beacon says, when communicating, is it good to break the six second rule, um, the six second round rule? Here's what I would say. Here's what I would say, Tiger Beacon. As a GM, you should give your players the opportunity to not have to engage in initiative. Now you can roll initiative, you can start the initiative, but if players 
you can, like as a gym, if you realize that your payers are like, whoa, I put down my weapon. I'm like, whoa, whoa there. Whoa, what's going on? Why are you so angry? Oh, look, he's got a thorn in his side. He's clearly very agitated. The moment that my players start breaking that kind of we're going to fight someone, I instantly kind of allow them to have the space to communicate and the space to make decisions. With that being said, look, six seconds is, you know, for example, in anime, you know, when and we're going to touch on this of role playing every round of combat and things like that. We're going to touch on that later for sure. Um, but I would say, you know, six seconds in anime, people monologue for what is meant to be six seconds that ends up lasting half a bloody episode. So I typically in my games don't have a mountain of problem if players want to try and communicate with something, try and talk with something and take a different avenue, even though we've rolled initiative. That is totally fine. And I would speculate in your games as well, whether you're running them or playing in them, really try and engage with that. Make it overt to your GM. Say, hey GM, above table, my character really doesn't want to fight this. I'm going to be laying down my weapons and trying to communicate it on uh, to communicate with it on every turn. You know, make that overt so that there's no like guess game going on between you and the GM as you interact with that creature and things like that. Well, that's how I would kind of go about it. That's kind of my advice is. Again, communicate with your GM, communicate with the other players. Hey, guys, you know, in role play, hey, guys, you know, I don't think we need to, I don't think we need to fight this, guys. Relax, whoa, whoa, put down your weapons, everyone, relax. You can see it's hurt, it's injured, it's got a thorn in its side, let's try and help this creature. Communicate that. The moment you do that, your GM's gonna have no choice but to try and, you know, bring you guys out of it and, and, and to try and engage with what you guys are doing. Remember, as Chaotic said during their intro, D&D is a game where your choices matter. Player agency is so, so important. So that is a massive, massive part of this. A um, couple of little bits in the chat. We've got um, Celtic Knot saying, one of my groups encountered a kobold toward the beginning of our campaign and our DM was planning on having it fight us, but we befriended it instead. Love that. Awesome. DMPC, force your DMs to be part of your party. I love that. Um, I've had to let my players know a few times that sometimes the best way out of a fight is not to start one. Fully, fully agree, Drake. And that that information, because D&D is a combat-based game, um, is an important one to continually remind your players of uh, all the time. I fully agree with that. Right, guys, thank you so much for all those amazing questions and points that you guys have made on that first point. We're going to move into our next section of advice here. This section is called The Environment the Combat Encounter Happens in and Levolution. I'm not sure if you guys have heard uh, of the word levolution before, um, but the environment is something that is brought up in almost every bit of advice content you can find on the internet about combat. The, everyone has their two cents about, oh, make it an interesting environment, make sure that your environments are creative, and meh, 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 meh. Everyone brings that one up, which is why I'm going to try and talk about something a little bit different today in terms of uh, the environment and how you can use your environment to your advantage as a GM as well as also as a player. So, uh, the first thing I wanted to explain was the word that I used a minute ago called LEVOLUTION, which you might be wondering, what in God's name, Bodhi, is LEVOLUTION? And LEVOLUTION is a word that was invented by the games company EA to describe the dynamic levels and terrain in their Battlefield 4 game at the conference at Gamescon in 2023. This was likely a marketing gimmick for the dude bro community, and that is the definition of Levolution. But to me, Levolution means something a little bit different, and it means a little bit of something important to me, actually, as a dungeon master. It's something I like to use very, very often in my games, and I have a couple of good examples for you guys. But here are the things that I wanted for you guys to consider. Now, having a creative environment is very fun. Having, you know, a dungeon under the water, you know, a deep cavernous, you know, dungeon, a, a, a you know, crawl through a, a, a jungle, you know, a, a mountainous region that your players are trying to scale and go through, a desert where there's nothing around them for miles to see but sand that seems to maybe be a bit quick in some places. Excuse me. Um, so... That is definitely, uh, you know, a big part of it. Be creative with where you set this stuff up. Obviously, that's dependent on where your players are in the world and what kind of part of the, the setting they're engaging with. But within that, you can be creative as well. So that's the first one. The next thing I want you guys to think about is the effects that spells 
and actions that your players take in the space and how those will alter the terrain around your players. Now, this is something that I feel often I see getting missed in D&D constantly. To me, it feels like if you let off a giant fireball in a tiny room, that would likely destroy that room. That's my personal uh, opinion of, of how this goes. So it's something to consider within your games. How do spells and the player's actions affect the terrain that they are currently transversing and, and working through? How does this shift the flow of combat? What difficulties does this bring up for both the players and the enemies in the combat? And furthermore, how does this alter the strategy that your players are taking in this moment? Now, that's a lot to consider, it's a lot of stuff to think about, but it's something that when you set up a combat encounter, you should be kind of asking yourself this question. If my players, I know my, you know, my wizard has fireball, if he lets off a fireball in this environment, what type of effect is that going to have? Now that might be something you think about beforehand, and it might be something that you, if you're a pantser GM that doesn't plan anything and you go by the, the hook of your pants, then you might want to be doing that in the moment and coming up with kind of how that works in your head in the moment. But either way, I would speculate it needs to be thought of at some point during the process of the combat encounter, whether it's the creation part, during the encounter itself, or possibly the consequences post that encounter. Um, as well. Now, quickly before I start asking for your guys' examples, because I want to hear lots of your guys' examples, and I know Matt has some great examples of this as well, <laughs> I will give you one from one of my games, and it was a super awesome moment. I had my players down in the sewers of the largest city in my world, and they're down there because uh, they've been tasked with finding some gems that were taken by something into the sewers, and they need to try and get them, right? They go down here and they discover gelatinous cubes that are being ridden by animated skeletons and lots of weird combat stuff that's going on. And these, these gelatinous cubes are actually the cleaning people of, of the sewers. They clean the sewers and get rid of all the shit as they absorb it and move over it and, and do all this stuff. And uh, one of our players, as they get to this room, they find the gems. They're like, okay, we need to get out of here now. We need to do so in the safest way possible. One of them let off, um, it was actually two players, one did a thunder wave and one did a fireball in the same turn of combat. Instantly, I'm like, cool, we're bringing down the sewers. What we're doing, guys, is we are now out of initiative, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep our initiative order, and I'm going to basically make you guys kind of roll to see whether you guys can survive this essentially cave-in that is happening. So the players start freaking out. They're like, oh my God, we're gonna get crushed under rubble. This is terrible. Let's start running. So they all just start sprinting and I'm making them roll D100s to see how many feet they go on the map each turn and seeing how quickly they're scattering out. It was the closest thing I've ever run to having a player die from something that was not an attack or something like that. One of our players squeaked out of the hole. The last person out barely made it out alive uh, with their rolls, and everyone loved it. It was this crazy high energy, you know, high anticipation, high fucking freaking out kind of moment. And what followed that was actually when they got back out of the sewers, a section, a large section of the city had actually collapsed inwards. A massive main road that was used for transportation of goods had collapsed. Instantly, the guards from the city rush this and start trying to cordon it off and work out what happened here, how did this happen, blah, blah, blah. And it caused ripple effects throughout the city um, uh, for the people that lived in the city. That's my example. It's one of my, it was one of my favorite little bits that, that I got to do um, with a map and, and terrain being affected by a player's decision to try and get the rest of the party out of trouble and actually put them into a whole lot more than they were expecting. Matt, do you want to throw an example of that yourself in, out there for people? Yeah. I'm going to flip it on its head, though. Hell yeah. you can, as a DM, you can use this to your own advantage as well and plan for these Levolution-type game-changing events, if you like, or terrain-changing events. So our campaign one uh, end fight, if you like, the big boss uh, in the last, uh, last but one episode, I think it is, um, casts Meteor Swarm. 
just in Golly. the middle of the uh, in the combat and just thinks, do you know what? Whoosh. So now the whole terrain changed. We've got these glowing, smouldering balls of fire that have landed in the terrain. That's demolished half of the trees. There's now craters. <coughs> There's new places for cover. There's different elevations people can get to. Um, definitely age-old Hail Mary, or when just a big bad ghost, you know what, I've had enough of you, is a bunch of meteors. So you can flip it on its head. It doesn't just have to be the player's actions that change that environment. It can be you deliberately changing the environment to um, invoke a new line of thinking, to uh, invoke uh, just a new concept, a new dichotomy to that encounter and change the stakes as well. And that's going to force the players to think differently about how they are fighting that current creature. Hell yeah. I love that so much as a GM. Use your tools. You got a toolkit. Pull something out that your players haven't seen in a while. That's a great one from there, Matt. Um, I actually want you guys now to get in the chat or to raise some hands to, to request to speak and give us some examples from your games where you've had some levolution happen, either because you've chosen to or because your players have done something that has caused an effect in the area. So first off, we have Celtic Knot with their hand raised. I am definitely going to come straight to you first. Uh, you have been invited to come in. Come on in. Come tell us what your, what your example is. You are muted currently, by the way, just so you know. Uh, you need to unmute yourself, Celtic Knot. I'm not sure if you're currently speaking. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it took me a second to find the button. Um... But uh, so my the uh, the Alexandria campaign that I'm in, um, mm -hmm. it was wasn't so much a um, an effect that we had on the physical terrain, but on the kind of social environment around us. Ooh, um, we had a uh, we had a bit of a PvP moment um, where our cleric and our warlock in our party got it, started fighting each other, and they were they started slinging spells. So I mean I'm a tiefling blood hunter i've got you know blood curse of the eyeless i've got i can cast darkness i'm trying to break this up mm. so um so i'm trying to blind them so they can't see each other and maybe they start thinking but they're still slinging spells and our warlock casts scorching ray and misses in the middle of a tavern Oof. um that's the tavern on fire we've got guards coming running we almost get arrested we managed to talk our way out of that and it and our DM managed to tie it into two of our players' backstories as well, where our uh, Dragonborn fighter got arrested for deserting the guard. We're, we're in, in Iman at this point, he, and he was former town guard, and he, he got arrested for desertion. And our, um, our cleric almost got, uh, almost got brought in if she hadn't dimension doored out and just run. Uh, but now... You know now people know who they are, so now we have that to contend with as well. Um, so it's made uh, it's made things very interesting indeed. Do you know what I love that so so much, Celtic Nod? That's such an interesting point, and it actually pertains beautifully to the next point that I was going to talk about as well. So I will circle back to that in just a moment. I'm going to drop you back into your audience and pull Drake in because I know Drake has an example that they would like to give as well. So I'm going to quickly do that but thank you for that one that's a super awesome interesting example that is you know slightly different from the environment and the the terrain itself being uh damaged which it was but it also had wider effects and problems that it caused love that super super sick thank you for that one um cool drake you are welcome to join buddy come on in and tell us all about your example my example well, i've got two actually my first example was first ever combat i ran as a dm was the cargo hold of a skyship. Mm. Um, my and it was a like proper cargo hold, like a cargo liner mm. kind of ship. So you had big containers. Um, one of my players uh, found a cannon, used it indoors, blew a hole through two containers and the side of the ship. Incredible. And because of my campaign at the time was very much the the sky was the only safe place. Mm. So I literally had to draw on the map going, okay, so this is now a hole. Go down there, you're dead. No recovery. Mm. Um, which my players used to their advantage. 
Of course. Until I decided to roll a D100 and cause some turbulence, which resulted in one of them almost being knocked out of the ship via cargo container. They blew up. Amazing. That's a super and sick one. I am very familiar with sky ships and how all of that works, so I love that. That example specifically uh, rings very true with me, so I love that, Dre. Go for it. Give us your second my, one, buddy. My second encounter was a... Um, my players found a deck of many things. One of them pulled the keep Ooh. card. And oh. they end up looking for the keep. Mm. I I read the card and went, okay, it's infested by monsters. Mm, I don't want to do cliche. So mm. it was abandoned, but infested with traps. And I, I'm i a long-time Looney Tunes fan. So yes. planning the session in advance, I went, okay, where's my Wily e. Coyote collection? Yeah. I need every trap possible which resulted in pitfalls, spike falls, the occasional landfill. Um, one which really annoyed my players was a floor of rakes trap, as in <laughs> the sideshow Bob rake. They take I a step, it. they fail a save, rake. My players hated it. I was trying desperately to wet myself with laughter. Um, but it's kind of thing. I always, when it comes to maps, I always plan to, okay, how can the environment be affected by players or by my own actions if I decide to? Yeah. Like turbulence. Um, one area I've got planned is by a beach, so I've got waves planned. Um, Amazing. I always like to throw in the occasional red barrel just because of I know my play. I know like straight fear into my players, and most of them play games with red barrels are explosive. Amazing. But my I red barrels are that. never an explosive. <laughs> I love that little that little flip on the head of having this keep that's meant to be filled with monsters instead filling it with traps. That's some incredible DM work right there. That is some very, very clever DM work. I love the Wily e. Coyote. I love the the, the Roadrunner style, uh, Looney Tunes style traps. I love the rake. I love the anvil. The anvil really killed me. That one had me chuckling, dude. That's uh that's awesome. Really, really clever stuff. Matt, I know you want to say something. Go on. I was going to say, it sounds like the bard was trying to prevent somebody getting into their house, right? It's that stereotypical, <laughs> how much chaos can I cause in one building knowing I'm never coming back? Uh, yeah. That is fantastic as well. It's an example, yeah. Drake. Well done. Yeah, well done, dude. Um, right, dude, I'm going to drop you back down. We've got another couple of examples and people who want to hop in. Thank you That's so much right. for that, Drake. Awesome, mate. Yeah, um, chaotic saying, I remember the Rhyme Palace of Trophy. Gold in which the combat started by one of the uh, PCs falling through a trap door as they encountered a very hungry creature that's below. Love that. Yeah, love a bit of terrain and, and that trap. Traps are another great way that you can have terrain be, you know, alterable and, and shiftable. That classic Scooby-Doo, you stand on something, the wall rotates and you ro rotate with it and suddenly the rest of your party don't know where you are, but you know where you are. That's a fun one. That's always a good one to, to spring on your players. Um, absolutely love that. Right. We have one other person who's hoping to jump in. Um, I have invited you to come in. Come on in. Yes, uh, one of the things that uh, <clears throat> my group has done uh, a number of times uh, is to have some kind of feature that would allow them to uh, defeat a monster in some way, usually yeah. some monster that there is no way they should even be trying to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with. For example, mm -hmm. uh, there is a uh, like a dike, and that you, if they can take that out, then it will flood the area where the monster is in or mm -hmm. in an ice cave and melting out part of it to get it to collapse and using the terrain to their benefit. Mm. Uh, but it's not necessarily something that's obvious. What is obvious is the desperation of the players because they're clearly outmatched. Um, mm. So trying to put in some of these things that they can use to try and get them thinking a little bit outside the I'm swinging my sword box. Love that. I absolutely love that. It's a great, great example and some very smart DM mentality right there. Of, you know what? Some of this environment, if you change it, is actually going to help you. And that's one of those things that you got to be weighing up when you're creating those environments and thinking about where the encounter is going to go. That's a super awesome point. Thank you so much for sharing that one. That's super nice. Do you have anything else you want to add before I drop you back into the audience? Uh, no, that's good. I'm having a great Amazing. time listening to everything you guys are saying. Awesome. 
Thanks, dude. I appreciate that. Hey, absolutely smashed it, dude. What, what an incredible bit of a contribution there. I appreciate that. Um, right, next up, we have Awesome coming in. Um, come on in, Awesome. Give us your example. I'm excited to hear it. Yeah. yeah, I just got reminded of that, actually, because of what the previous person said. I um, in my So my cr players are currently facing trials to gain mm -hmm. more powers against the BEG, and the trial they're currently facing is the trial of death, which Ooh. puts them into a little maze, labyrinth kind of style uh, dungeon, and they're being hunted currently by the Guardian of Death, which Ooh. is a monster that they can fight, but it will respawn unless they basically destroy all the little like the little vessels hidden around the labyrinth so they have to run around in the labyrinth while being chased by death i love that that's awesome and oh, actually yeah. pertains to something we're going to talk about a little bit later about uh objectives during um during encounters uh, that is super super awesome um Freaking great idea. Freaking great. I love the trials idea. Um, I actually was planning uh, an actual play centered around uh, a young princeling who needs to go out and, and endure five trials to become the king of, uh, of, his, of his city. And that's something that we're, we're actually still playing with that at Homie and the Duna are considering uh, running that one and, and recording it for you guys um, in the future. But dude, absolutely love that. Um, anything else from you before I drop you back to the audience? Uh, no, that's it. Awesome. Sick. Thank you so much for that one. Great, great example. Um, how, guys, can I just say, the energy in the gym is incredible right now. The energy in the gym is incredible. You guys are doing awesome. I love all the contributions. This has been so much fun so far, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, the next thing that I wanted to touch upon in terms of environments, and uh, Celtic Knot mentioned this, and I think it's a super important one that is uh, needed to be considered as well. Um, and it's the consequences of certain environments that combat happens in, as well as also the consequences of altering those environments and what that then leaves for the campaign and things like that. You know, I mentioned in mine that the, the, you know, the roof collapses in the sewers and then suddenly a part of the city has been destroyed. That then causes chaos in the city. Celtic not mentioned the tavern burning down and them being wanted and this kind of fallout that happens from this moment. A great example that I was going to use was, um, it's a classic movie trope, you know, you see a bad guy running away from a cop, they round the corner into a crowded intersection, and they disappear into the crowd. The cop comes around the corner with their gun out, and they're like, go to fire, and they're like, I can't shoot because if I, if I let a bullet go, I might hit a civilian. That is a very interesting situation with consequences that forces your players to think about their actions as well. Putting them in environments where the consequences of them doing reckless things could actually damage or hurt other people um, or other NPCs or other creatures is a very real thing. That happens all the time in real life and I think that's an important one to include in your games. You know, it's it's the classic. You know, if you sh if you let off an explosion in an underwater cavern, it's going to start filling up with water. It's the classic. You're on the side of a mountain and you let off a thunder wave. That is definitely going to cause an avalanche. You know, and then what does that avalanche do? Does it take out the village at the bottom of the mountainside? Does the caves filling up with water mean that from now on the locals who used to use this caves as a place to learn diving can no longer be used because it's now filled with water and it broke years of tradition within the community? That's stuff that you guys need to be thinking about when you're thinking about how the terrains when they are altered um, can cause problems and consequences for, for the actions of the players. I'm a big, big fan. As you guys can see, I love consequences. I love the players knowing that their actions are doing things in the world. And I think that's super, super important. Matt, do you have anything you want to say about that one? I was just going to touch on that final point you made there, mm. which it makes people feel like they're doing things in the world. It gives players a little bit of um, agency in that world, if you like. And totally. the stuff I do matters. The stuff I do is going to change the environment around me. Um, it's a little bit off topic, if you like, with sort of combat. Um, but giving your players those opportunities to almost describe what happens as well. I sometimes will just dive into an area and say, okay, you tell me what, 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 what do you see? 
give them some framework, but then allow them to have that world building moment as well. And you can do that within these combat bits as well. Okay, you've just set off Thunder Wave on a snow capped mountain. What do you think that's going to do? And totally. giving though them that option to describe it as well. Totally. I love that. I love that. Player agency is a big one. And having your player's world build is so, so important. I fully, yeah. fully agree with that. Um, Takes guys, the pressure off you as well. <laughs> yeah, that's a good tool. <laughs> uh, cool. That kind of brings us to the end of our environment and levolution section of kind of conversation. Quickly before we move on, I just wanted to ask, does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to ask about what we've just spoken about or uh, kind of uh, anything, any points that they'd like to make or anything like that before we move on? If you do, please drop it in the chat or request to speak and we're happy to uh, uh, engage with any of that stuff, guys. If not, we shall move on very swiftly to the next point. Um, Seems like everyone's happy as far as I can see. Ain't, ain't nobody typing. Ain't nobody raising no hands. So let's... Oh, oh, there we go. There we go. There we go. Okay. I'm bringing you in. Bringing you in now. There you go. Come on in. Uh, I, I just want to point out, uh, as you said, that, uh, you know, oh, you throw this out. You want to describe it as you set off this thunder wave uh, you know, on a snow-capped mountain. Um, it is important that the the players understand what's going to happen uh so like what, what kind of rules you're using for say hitting bystanders mm -hmm. or or thus um you know they may have a clever idea in mind and not see something that you see and you may not see their idea and uh they cast something that you for example a spell or do some take some action that just seems to you ridiculous like oh that's going to collapse the tunnel or oh that's going to you know do something terrible um and and they don't realize how you're seeing it mm -hmm. and sometimes not knowing everything is good but uh they need to to have some kind of understanding of say the way that the physics will work or something yeah. like that so maybe if you see them there to think that they're not uh taking a very wise or perhaps a stupid course of action to give them a little bit of a, well, you think it might collapse the tunnel, but you could throw it, you know? <laughs> yeah, totally. Roll an insight check before you do that. Roll a perception, you know, yeah, totally. And give them that little bit of info. I love that. It's a really good point. It's also something you can address in session zero as well, which as GMs, we all know is a very important thing, you know, address that stuff in session zero. You can let them know how the mechanics and other things like that are going to work in your world. So I think that's a really, really great point. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's super, super awesome. <laughs> Um, hell yeah. I'm going to drop you back into the audience. Thank you for that one. That is awesome. Okie dokie. Always terrifying question from the DM. Are you sure? Damn right. That is a very terrifying question from the GM. 100%. You couple that with a DM dice roll behind the scenes. You can just watch all the players go, oh shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love that one. Right, guys. Now, the next one is what I would call an advanced technique for enhancing your combat and making your story a little bit more immersive. It's something that I believe takes a little bit more practice and is across the board kind of frowned upon in the TTRPG community space, in the D&D space. But for me personally, as someone who loves movies, and who loves, you know, anime, who loves, you know, TV shows, who loves all these mediums of storytelling. It's often one used in those mediums. And so I believe it's a great way that you can add some depth to your story. So what we're talking about next is separating the party. Taking your players and spreading them out and forcing them to go down different paths and different routes um, into, uh, it could be in the, you know, a similar combat situation. It could be separate combat situations. It could just be generally across the game as a whole. But it's something I wanted to bring up because I've had multiple groups in multiple different combat situations all at the same time on very different parts of a city or, uh, you know, of a, of a world map or a continent or things like that based on the party splitting up and doing this stuff. And what I'm going to try and help you guys with today is teaching you hopefully a methods, a couple methods that you can use that means that you're not afraid to split the party as a GM, that it's one of those tools that you can whip out. You don't need to do it all the time, but it's a tool within your arsenal that you can whip out to use at any point um, if you so 
uh, please to do so. And like I said, this does require practice. It took me ages to get to grips with how I kind of run it and how I think is best to do it. Um, but it's definitely something um, that you're going to have to formulate your own opinion on and try and find the story beats of your world and your moment and things like that. So firstly, I wanted to dive into there's benefits to doing this. There's massive benefits to splitting the party, and these are definitely not often talked about in the TTRPG space. One of them is it forces the party to work together in ways that they may not have needed to before. You know, you match the cleric with the warlock and suddenly they have, uh, you know, a whole new dynamic that they have to deal with where you have the ranger and the barbarian together. Or you can mix that up and into any sort of combination. And forcing those players to use one another's abilities, skills, and RP and characters in ways that they might have not done so because as a group they've been kind of interacting in maybe a bit more of a uniform fashion and kind of finding a groove with how they do things. That's spice. That's flair. It, uh, it messes with your players, which is, you know, uh, sometimes a very, very good thing to do. And this includes both the RP aspect because, you know, you might not have had a chance for the cleric and the warlock to actually get some one-on-one -on -one time with each other to talk about some stuff because the party is always together. It could also be forcing the players to combine their abilities and combine the features and, uh, you know, actions and uh, stuff that they have together in ways that they might not have thought to do because usually they have the healer there healing everyone and now we don't have a healer with us so how are we healing each other? What's the plan in terms of healing and how are we going to deal with this, you know, kind of thing. Forces them to think in new ways. Love that one. One of my favorite things about splitting the party up. Would you like to add any other benefits, Matt, before I move on to the negatives of splitting up a party? I think that's the big positive, uh, yeah, the big benefit there, the big positive is that it forces that different uh different neuron connection if you like in the brain to say okay we can't just do our standard stuff um yeah. can't just have the barbarian run and kick the door down and then we'll go do this maybe we need to a little bit be a bit more stealthy around this because you and i are the the squishy members of the party we need to think about this in more detail or um we need to make sure we're doing this in a certain way and yes totally. it's Again, giving the players something else to work with to make the game more immersive, to make them think and uh, make them think in different ways as well. It's, it's the biggest benefit to splitting the party, which, as, as you rightly called, is probably the biggest controversial topic <laughs> in terms of party play in D&D. Don't split the party. No, why not? Get on with it. 100%. Um, we've got Celtic not saying, in the above table sense as well, it's also a good way to work around a player who has to miss a yep. session. I would agree with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I would fully fully agree with that. I would also speculate. I'm going to be I'm going to I'm going to counter that ever so slightly because I'm a GM that likes to stick with continuity of plot and not just throw something random in because someone's not going to show up. I'd rather not run a session than run a session that means that like a key part of the overarching plot that we currently have going on is happening. That's kind of my methodology and stuff. So I would speculate at times it works and other times it definitely doesn't Celtic not. So that's my opinion on it though. I, I If it works at your table and that's a good tool for you guys to use when people are, are missing, totally use it to the nth degree. Make it work. Love that so much. Um, I think it certainly works when you've got enough advanced knowledge of that person missing totally. the session as well. If you've got time to plan for it, great. Sometimes okay. in those last minute, I'm, I'm really stuck. I can't make the sessions. That could pose a little bit of an issue there. Totally. Then the negatives of splitting the party, which, you know, we talk about a lot. One, it's a lot more work for the GM. Realistically, you got to be thinking about two separate plot lines at this point, or possibly, you know, if your party's broken up into more than just two groups, you know, multiple different plot lines that are all happening possibly concurrently, or, you know, uh, it's all on separate kind of timelines, or, or however you kind of want to do that. Um, and timelines is a thing that I like messing with in my D&D campaign a lot, jumping forward in time, jumping back in time, doing flashbacks, you know, all, all this kind of stuff. It's a thing that I'm a big, big fan of, but that's my weird storytelling kind of method. Um, but it definitely requires the GM to use more brain power and to be more cohesive. They really need to have a grasp of their world, their story, and again, the actions and consequences that are happening to both or multiple parties um, that have split from the singular party that they once were. On top of that, 
it might force players who maybe, you know, for example, Matt and I are very good friends. We join a game together as buddies and we're super happy. We don't know many of the other players at the table. And then suddenly we're separated and it forces me to, to interact with people that I'm not so familiar with. I'm a little bit nervous about interacting with them with. Now, that can be seen as a good or bad thing. You know, honestly, it depends on the players and it depends on, you know, whether you're super extroverted or introverted or, you know, how you feel about, you know, stepping out of your comfort zone and things like that. But it definitely can be a negative thing, which is why I think it's important to bring that up. And it's something to, when you are, you know, considering splitting up the party or when you do like have a session zero say, you know, how do people feel about us splitting up the party? Are, are you guys cool if I do it in this manner and, you know, we do this kind of stuff? And if everyone's cool with it, makes total sense to go ahead. But also you've got to be aware that some people might not be so cool with that. I've definitely been in parties where I've been like, let's split up gang. And they've been like, no, <laughs> like, you know, we will not be splitting up. That sounds terrible. And so, you know, you've got to be able to, you know, work as a team and work out what the best kind of option is. So it definitely can be a negative. Now, let's talk about the two methods that I see that GMs can go about splitting the party and how to run a split party. I believe there's two core methods to doing this. Now, the first one I am not a fan of. I am not a fan of at all. However, I think it is a definitely a introductory method that allows you to kind of test the waters and kind of get to grips with how it all works. As well as that, I reckon using that in conjunction with method two actually works really nicely as well. So method one is think of, for example, for those of you familiar with Marvel, Avengers Endgame. They all get separated out to go chase infinity stones and everyone's trying to go back in time and capture a certain infinity stone and there's different groups that are sent off to do that. It's one of the things that made some of that plot very, very interesting. And you had, you know, this group kind of separated and everyone trying to work cohesively together at the same time with things failing and other things being successful at various different points during that cohesive kind of movement as they were all separated. Another great example in pop culture, for those of you who aren't aware of Marvel, is like Ocean's Eleven, for example. Um, the heist movie in Las Vegas, where, you know, a bunch of people all have separate jobs. You have the guy who's doing the, the EMP underneath the city. You have the two guys that are acting as the guards and wheeling the, um, the, the dude who can fold himself up into the bin, into the vault. You've got the other guys who are blowing up the elevator shaft and sliding in. You've got people causing distractions, you know. That is, th those are two good examples of when that storytelling works awesomely. That storytelling worked amazingly for both of those examples and led to super sick movies that were super interesting and super like gave, gave a li little bit more diversity than just, and the party are working together and everyone's kind of trudging along and we're doing everything together as a little team, which uh, was awesome. So those are two examples. Uh, and they use this tool to tell multiple angles all at once, um, you know, and that gives you more option for more storytelling. So, method one. I personally believe it's not as cinematic, but it still can work very well. However, it may get boring for, for example, if you split your party into two, it may get a little bit boring for the half of the party that isn't in the limelight, essentially, is how I put this. But this is a great starting off place. And I would say, basically, you tell one group's story, until you reach what I call a large checkpoint. And a large checkpoint is something that is a, a moment in the story that you feel is a good point to flip over to the other party. Now, large checkpoints are typically things like moments of objective um, that are either failed or achieved by the party. For example, completing a battle, losing a pursuer, solving a puzzle you know, big moments of, of achievement or failure from the party that then is like, okay, you came out of that battle, now we're gonna switch to the other group. Or you solved your puzzle before the door opens, we're moving to the other group. And then you tell the other group's story until they get to a large objective. That is method one. And like I said, it works, it definitely works, but you will often find one half of the party ends up sitting there for a little bit too long, 
and often losing their attention and kind of drifting off and maybe chatting amongst themselves, maybe munching on some of those chicken wings that you put on the table or, you know, whatever it might be. And they might, uh, you know, someone might run to the toilet quickly as their character is not being asked to do anything in this moment. So I would say use that sparingly. It's, it's, it's one that can be a great tool, but also can be a detriment to your party as well. Matt, do you want to talk about method one, uh, about anything to do with method one? Yeah, so I think because it's slower, so mm. to speak, than the method we're going to talk about in method two, yeah. there's some go- there's some opportunities where it's great to use this method, and mm. then there's scenarios where it's not so great. So if you've got every your whole party at the table, this that's probably where you're going to struggle with this method, to be honest. But if we go back to that scenario where we know we're not going to have a couple of players for maybe a session or maybe we're going to have different groups of players for a couple of sessions, then that presents a good opportunity to know what, okay, well, we will split the party in this instance, and we'll spend this session going over what you guys do, the next session going over what you guys do. And that then doesn't make it feel as clunky. Um, It doesn't make it feel as slow, because it's still those players that are present at the table, nobody's being left out and just have to sit and watch, so to speak. Um, At least that's that's my advice. If you're going to use method one, Try and do it when you know you're going to be missing one of those people, or at least make sure you've had the discussions with folks to say, okay, there is going to be a period of this where if we split this party like this, you are, you guys are just going to have to sort of sit and twiddle your thumbs for a little bit while we deal with this, and then we'll we'll come into your part. Totally. I, I fully agree with everything that you said. Matt, just laying down the laws, guys. Just just the, <laughs> just 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 the guy. The the guy. The one. The 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 guy when we're talking about it. Love it, Matt. Um so then method two, and this is the method that I use and has worked phenomenally for me in my games and often uh, allows you to keep it fresh and actually involves you switching back and forth very quickly almost between the two situations. So method two is much more cinematic um, and it keeps people on their toes. This uses mini checkpoints. So as opposed to those large checkpoints where large moments of like story beat happen, you know, like we finish a combat, we solve a puzzle, we, you know, we escape the pursuer, you know. These are when smaller checkpoints happen within the story. And often in film and things like that, it's called a story beat is is what it's referred to. Um, And these are great moments to flip between the groups. So mini checkpoints are moments when small objectives or story beats are hit by the party. For example, a a single round of combat ends. For example, uh, an important line of dialogue is delivered by a player or an NPC. Um, For example, a new NPC or enemy enters the scene or enters the moment. And one of my absolute favorite ones, because this makes everyone (gasps) on edge and freak out, is when an important dice roll is made, the player rolls the dice, they tell you, GM, I I got a 16. And you go, amazing. Hold that thought. And we cut back to the other group. And they're like, wait, you're not going to tell me? What, what, what? You're not going to tell me what my 16 got? This causes the ability for you to switch back and forth, whether it's, you know, in between rounds of combat, back and forth, back and forth. It could be your player goes, and you know what? I'm coming to find you. Cut. Amazing scene. Cool. Flip back over to the other group. Hitting those story beats actually ends up being so so powerful um, in those moments and so, so like almost just uh, like keeps people on the edge of their seat. And you know what? Tiger Bacon just beat me to it. Absolutely beat me to it, which is the cliffhangers. The switches work best as little cliffhangers. If you can leave one party going, "Uh, but but, but, but I want to know more and then go to the other party and leave them going, "But, but, 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 but I need to know more. That's the shit right there. That is some awesome storytelling. You will find your player so engaged and so like listening to what's happening and worrying about the other half of the party. Like, oh shit, they're not going to make it to the rendezvous. Oh God, we fucked this. This is all a mess. Oh my God. You know, or even just like, yes, go on, get it. Yeah, you did awesome. That's so sick. You know, and it really becomes this back and forth that is super, super fun. Matt, have you got anything about method two that you want to add or or mention? 
Uh, no, I just uh, every oh yeah. Anybody that's watched Mortal Magic, uh, Molten Magic, will know how much I love a cliffhanger uh, yeah. and how much I annoy my players with cliffhangers as well. Because we do have those moments of like, oh, no, I want more. Um, but it is a great method. It keeps people invested as well. The only thing you have to be careful with is, is, is that you don't make the cliffhanger too good to the point where the other half of the party are going, no, 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 no. Forget us. Go back to that. So yeah. make sure you keep that story beat going. But. Uh, Think, yeah, most people work with their players enough to know when the right type of uh, cliffhanger is to delay at what moment as well. Totally. Fully, fully agree. Um, and the final points that I want to talk about this, and Matt kind of mentioned one of them, is balance. Um, these are two things that you need to be considering, and then one of them is a little piece of advice for you guys. Balance is a big one. You need to be making sure you're giving each group their limelight, their spotlight, their moment of being the badasses or the dunces or whatever it is. You need to give the groups their moments of being, uh, you know, successful in that and giving them the limelight, giving them the spotlight to, to be awesome, to do these amazing things. So balancing that as well as also making sure that every player within those groups is still getting the spotlight as you would if the whole party was together, basically. So I would definitely consider, you know, your balance of like, okay, we've been doing this group for a little bit of time now. I now need to switch back and I'm going to give them about an equal amount of time um, in their kind of plot so that they feel like they've got enough time and airspace as well. Definitely, definitely consider the balance all the way through while you're doing this. Keep adjusting as a dungeon master constantly. And then the final thing that I want to mention is the C Mike special. For those of you who don't know, uh, C Mike or Carmichael is an ex member of Corridor Digital and now has his own amazing uh, D&D channel called Fables D20. Um, and it's an awesome, awesome series. We actually got to speak to him and we'll be releasing a podcast with him very very soon. Um, and within that podcast, he talks about a method that he uses that I think would work great for this splitting party stuff, which is when you have one party doing something as a GM, and Matt mentioned this earlier, handing some of the agency of the DM seat to the party that aren't in the spotlight. So a good example of that might be one of the players is like, I'm running on a bit of ground that is collapsing beneath me. You know, think a uh, bridge, bridge of Khazad Doom in, in uh, Lord of the Rings kind of situation. And they're running and they're, the ground's falling away. And it's like, oh my God, I'm trying to get to the other end. And instead of as a GM, you go, make me a dex check or a dexterity saving throw to see if you make it to the other side before the ground falls away beneath you. You turn to the group of players that are not currently in the spotlight. And you go, hey guys, or you pick on one of them individually and you go, hey, does he make it yes or no? I just want a yes or no answer. And you put the earnest on the other players. Now you might have an evil player who goes, no, he doesn't make it. And it then forces the part, the group that are in the spotlight to try and manage catching this person, make sure turn around, grab them, oh. oh. Or they might be like, yes, he makes it by the skin of his teeth. He manages to get onto the safe bit of rock and he does manage to get away. Instantly, you re-engage those players who are not in the spotlight by forcing them to take on a bit of that GM role and kind of activate some of their own creativity to see and alter the moment for themselves. It's a great tool. It's one that up until speaking to C Mike, I had never used in my games and I will be using it going forward constantly because it is freaking genius. It's super, super genius. And it keeps people so, so engaged. We've got Celtic not saying that's a phenomenal idea. By the way, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you joining us. Thank you for that one. Um, we've also got Tiger Bacon saying that is good. Yeah, fully agree. Matt, do you want to add anything to that? No, I'm nicking that idea as well. Uh, it's it's banging. Way. So, especially with one of my uh, my groups, I call them. It's not their official party name, but I call the, them the connoisseurs of chaos because wherever mm. they can sow chaos, they will sow chaos. Letting them do that uh, is probably going to cause me more of a headache, but it's going to be so much fun. So we're absolutely doing that in the future. Yeah. I love that idea. Hundred percent. That's a little sneaky one for you guys. That uh, that is a little <laughs> tidbit and and an awesome one. Now, what I'd love to do is have you guys uh, get into the chat and let us know about moments where um, your party was split up, where you felt it either wasn't done super right and you were left going, ah, man, this kind of sucked. Or moments where your party split up and you were like, my GM nailed this shit. I'm so fucking stoked with how that went. The storytelling 
excuse me, was amazing. And I absolutely love that. So if you have any of those moments, either raise your hand to come in and tell us an example or get in the chat and type, type away um, your moment. I would love to hear some of your guys' moments where that has happened awesomely. Matt, do you have, uh, do you have any uh, on the top of your head that are examples while we're waiting for other people to drop their examples in? Yeah, I've had a, a couple of examples, uh, actually. I, uh, in my homebrew world, um, nicked a quick uh, mini module from Candlekeep. Um, mm -hmm. We had a moment where the party had split themselves. Uh, and I can't remember the exact name of that mini module, but it's the one where the dwarves are building the uh, well, dwarves or gnomes are building a bloody space rocket, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just about to go off. And of course, half the party are just going, yeah, we just want to loot. Not interested in the rest of this. We're just going to go and loot. OK, you guys go loot. We'll go figure that out. Um, and that worked really well because they weren't then aware of what was going on in the other corridor where one of the party had fallen into a poison trap and the rocket then went boom. And so one player just gone. There's no way you survive in those flames and the other ones just sat there listening to screams at the bottom of an acid trap, poison trap, while the others are just looting gold all out of the place. So, uh, yes, that was very quick. Let's move from each group to uh yeah move from each group to see what's going on and yeah i'm opening this chest now okay make me make me thieves tool check or maybe dexterity yeah. check uh i'm trying to climb out of this well okay make me an acrobatics check or an athletics check uh i want to poke this button poke the button uh and boom there goes the rocket so yeah it, it's I'm a lot of fun it. uh it's it is a i think just just the word of warning, I think, is it is extra work on the DM's front. It can be totally. so rewarding, but just prepare yourself for that little bit of extra work, and your mind needs to work almost three times as fast as your players' minds at the same time. Hell yeah. Right. We've got a couple people who are raising hands, like, yeah, I'm going to come in That's and give an example. Answer. The first person who has raised their hand is a new person in the workshop tonight, so I'd love for you to introduce yourself. Just give us uh, your, your Discord name, um, and then give us your example. You have been invited to speak. I actually don't know your username at the moment, um, but come on in and, uh, and speak, because uh, I have it blocked because I'm, I'm recording this at the moment. Um, it's the person who has like the, the yellow background with the red dragon thing. I've invited you to come and speak. Come on in and tell us your example. We'd love to hear it. The cat Phoenix, is that that name, I think? Yes, I think I can also, I, I've invited them to speak, but I think you have to accept the invite, um, Sir Phoenix. Um, we will just wait for you to do that. Uh, we've got Mad Maven, the DM. Oh, here we go. I'll invite you again. There you go. The invite's been done again. Try and hop in this time. Um, the DM, uh, my DM is especially good at making side stories for players who will not be available for a week or two. He can split them out and splice them back in seamlessly, uh, yet they don't feel like they've missed out. That's awesome, Mad Maven. Kick-ass GM. Love that. Um, great skill. The Phoenix, are, are you, are, I'm, I'm not sure if I can just, can I drag you? No, I can't drag you. I'm not sure if there's a way for me to get you in here myself. I believe you have to accept the invite in, um, which I'm sorry, I'm not able to, uh, I'm not able to bring you in here myself. You've got to accept it yourself. Um, and, uh, and currently, I, I assume you're struggling to do so. Um, we'll give you another couple minutes, and then if you're not able to do so, feel free to type it away in the chat. Um, and we'll get someone else in to speak. I think yeah, what's so this from the nerdy maker as well? Uh, I was the GM, they were in a cave system in the Underdark and were tasked with the rescuing some deep gnomes from Fomorian. I love a Fomorian. Once the leader had been killed, the rest grabbed a gnome and split, chasing down the Fomorians. It was definitely fun. Nice. <laughs> love, love that, that as well. Love that, the nerdy maker. That's super, super awesome. Um, I'm going to give you one more invite to speak. Um, Phoenix, Phoenix profile picture there, there we, we go, go. amazing <laughs> sorry <laughs> it's all good do not apologize at all it. don't apologize at all go for it introduce yourself and give us uh, give us your example thank you yeah so i i'm the cat phoenix uh and i uh used to actually uh dm a co-dm group uh Ooh. where uh, <laughs> yeah uh me and one of my other friends uh, DM'd a group of about eight players, mm -hmm. uh, and we ran them through a sort of a futuristic fantasy world. Uh, and the way we did it, <laughs> yeah, uh, the way we did it was we co DM'd the first part of the campaign, uh, mm -hmm. like the introduction, and then 
uh, once they got to a certain plot point, we split the party in two uh, through a puzzle, and each of them explored one of the storylines, and then to end off the campaign, the parties met up together to defeat the final major boss. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, golly, you've got me. You got me on the edge of my seat. That sounds absolutely amazing. That sounds super, super dope. Uh, Matt, you you also you got the same reaction I've got going on right now. Yeah, like that sounds like a lot of fun. I want to know how much communication was going on behind the scenes by the between the DMs there, just to go. My group's doing this. What's your group doing? How can we mix that in? There? That sounds epic. Yeah. yeah, it it was. There was um it, me. Uh, it was me and one of my friends. His name was Gavin. Uh, and he uh basically uh what was happening uh behind the scenes is there was a. Uh, like a um, master mage or economist who was trying to take over a city but uh, was using other technology and magic from different regions. And so the players uh, first found themselves stuck in like a winter wonderland uh, and found in one of those experiment locations. Uh, and through that experiment location had to go to like uh, my party went to a jungle and had to purify this uh, forgotten and ruined castle uh, by destroying these crystals that this economist made. And the mm -hmm. other group had to go through the city that he was ruling over and uh, try to destroy the corrupt underbelly. Uh, Hell yeah. The parties then teamed up. <laughs> yeah, the parties then teamed up and took down his castle or his tower that he was ruling from uh, layer by layer awesome. until they defeated him. Nice. <laughs> that sounds so yeah. freaking sick, dude. I am, I am hyped. Like the hype that I'm feeling right now, just listen to that. You, like actual play. Well, record that. I want to watch that. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> that sounds... That sounds super dope. I would actually spend time watching that. Screw Critical Role. That's what I want to watch. That sounds amazing. Um, that is super, super dope. No, thank you for sharing that example. That is a super, super dope example. and One that I was so not expecting tonight. So thank you so much for that and joining uh, the workshop. Welcome uh, to the homie in the dude space uh, and to the familia. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to drop you back down into the audience now. Thank you for that one. Sounds Hell. good. No problem. Hell <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, next up, we have got um, Celtic Knot coming in, wanting to share an experience. Bring it on, Celtic Knot. You have been invited. Come on in. Uh, you are muted again. <laughs> there we go. So nice. My example isn't uh, not as interesting as, uh, as the Cat Phoenix had there, but uh, we did have our, our party split up. Uh, as basically, as soon as we got to Whitestone, we all we all just kind of scattered onto our own personal little quests. Um, and uh, and our DM kind of went the the first method. He went just with with the major story beats. So like mm -hmm. our cleric went. To, so we our uh, our big bad for our campaign now. Now that we've finished the uh, Call of the Nether Deep portion, our big bad for our campaign is now the Queen of Air and Darkness. Um, <laughs> so you've you've uh, spoke spoke to me of my soul there, Celtic Knot, Fay, Fairy, Queen of Air and Darkness. I am all for that stuff. Yeah, our our clerics, our our, our warlock's patron is the Queen of Air and Darkness, and my my blood hunter, um, she's uh, Order of the Profane Soul, and the Queen of Air and Darkness is her patron as well, and she has been tormenting us endlessly, and it's awesome. Um, but, uh, so we, we split off, our cleric went to, um, went to her, her friend It is also, uh, in the queen's clutches at the moment, and, uh, she went to, you know, spend 24 hours casting Hallow on his house in case he comes home and he can maybe mm. throw off her influence. Um, our, uh, our fighter, uh, this was somebody who was not able to beat it that day, we found out when we got back to the tavern later that he'd been kidnapped um mm. and my character went off to uh the altar of the raven because i've been talking about possibly multi-classing so that's where i took my first level of paladin nice. of the raven queen and um ah, so we so... we all had a, we all had a few minutes you know individually doing our own doing our own things and then we came back together to go rescue thastos our fighter and uh it was just it, it was like this awesome moment everybody coming back together 
all of our you know new insights and new powers just kind of uh just setting the new party dynamic and it was it was a it was an awesome uh awesome experience that sounds so so dope and hey do not even begin to belittle your party split at the beginning like you did. I don't want to hear any of that tonight. It's just as awesome. I will not stand for any of that. Um, that sounds super dope. I love that you guys all went off, kind of tackled some personal side quests, came back together and were like, oh shit, homie's been captured. <laughs> we need to go solve that problem. That's a, that's a problem that we have now to go and fix. So I love that. That's a super, super sick example. And well done to your GM for being able to manage that. And like I said, hey, there's nothing wrong with the first method. It's definitely one to get started with. I fully, like, though it's not my favorite way of doing it, it's definitely a great dipping your toe in and learning the splitting the party kind of situation. So awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I really, really appreciate that. I think those downtime activities are actually, I've said it in the chat, downtime, that idea of downtime in D&D &D does present a unique opportunity to use that first method because it can be, okay, we're just going to, what are you doing for downtime? Let's go yeah. focus on that. Now what do you do? To do it? And then you bring everybody back together once they're all done. So yeah, and that's, that's awesome. Thank you very 100%. much for sharing that as well. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Very much appreciate that. I'm going to drop you back into the audience and we're going to pull Drake, the one and only, back up in here. Drake, you've been invited. Come on in, buddy. Come tell us your example. Uh, this was my attempt at splitting the party. Um, basically, halfway point of the campaign, like getting to level 10, because um, one of the big things I mentioned in my campaign is they're now in the past. Mm. Basically, save the past from becoming a post apocalyptic sky filled future. Um, but I split the party in two ways. So I had them in, like, I've got a party of four at that point. So I had two, two together and another two together. I basically split them to do different tasks based on the kind of player I observed them as. So two players who were very gung-ho, they go in, fight, do that. Their task was, okay, you can't fight this enemy. You encounter someone who needs help while they're in a cage. Do you help them? Do you try to kill them? And they basically... I struggled trying to keep it so the other players were still interactive. It mm -hmm. didn't work at all, because... My best mate, who was on the other, who was part of the other group, um, quite literally went to get food <laughs> um, <laughs> during it, and not fun because the closest food place is about ten minutes. <laughs> Incredible. Oh dear. And and do, do you know um, what I would do you know what I'd say though, Drake? Like it's one of those situations where hey, look, we're all learning, dude. So you know that's your first instance of trying this, where it might not have been one hundred percent successful, and that's totally cool. Failure is the only way we learn. If you succeed, you don't learn freaking anything from success. You just succeed and feel good about yourself. That's it. So what you learn from this situation is stuff that you can take into next time you split the party, 100%. Did you have something else you wanted to add? Yeah, it's kind of thing um, with me and the party, because of how, when I've been a player, mm -hmm. every time a DM has split the party, it's been... You've, he, they always split, so it's like down the middle, 50-50, as mm -hmm. close as possible. And in my case, because of at the time I was new D&D, &D, so I didn't really know what to do and everything, I ended up being silent. I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know monk abilities well enough at that point. <laughs> so I didn't know what to do. So, um, yeah. so I kind of took inspiration from there and said, okay, I'll split down the middle. Yeah. And I'll try to, I buy the task that goes against their natural player type. Yeah. Like for my party, but it's something my main issue with splitting the party is just trying to keep it so everyone's entertained because I I like moral issues. I like put make it so my players have to think about their actions. Yeah. I'm not very combat heavy. <laughs> I'm the yeah. opposite of one of my other players who loves combat. I am the I I am I'm on the spectrum mm. and I, I don't do numbers well. <laughs> That's so large dude, groups, I'm like, totally uh, fine. Yeah. So I always do small encounters. I'm like, okay, how do I make a one that's built for people who don't do combat? How do I, do, do I keep them, keep the other group entertained? Like my main issue is keeping the other group entertained. Mm -hmm. uh, well, use hey, you can use some of those techniques that we've talked about tonight. You know, the passing the almost GM responsibility to the other group, using some of those more mini checkpoints to kind of jump back and forth between the groups a little bit faster. But hey, look. This is what I'm going to say to you, and it's a bold statement, and I'm going to just say it. 
you got to do it to get better at it. So I know it's a scary thing. I know at the moment you don't feel like, uh, whether it be confident or whether it be, you know, uh, you know, feel like you're good at it. But guess what? The more you do it, the better you'll get. So that's the only way that you can get better at it is just practice it. And if that means, you know, you do it with a smaller party that isn't your main group and you run some one shots where you split people up to practice it and all that kind of stuff, that is definitely the way to go about it. So, hey, do not be afraid of the unknown. The unknown is where the cool stuff in life happens. It's where we grow. It's where we progress. And you know what? Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate, you know, you coming in and sharing a story of, you know, one where you've struggled, one where, you know, it hasn't been so successful. We've got some beautiful success stories in the chat and people have told awesome stuff. I love that you've come in and talked about one that wasn't so successful because we all experience that. We all experience failure. You know, I fail constantly, bro, like constantly. So I really appreciate you having the, 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 the bravery and the courage to come and talk about that today. So thank you for, for sharing that with the group. I'm sure everyone found that very insightful and, uh, and, and probably learned a little bit about themselves in that moment as well. So that's super, super awesome. Drake, I'm gonna drop you back into the audience. Thank you for being amazing. I really, really appreciate that, you legend. Right, up next, we have um, our veteran of the uh, of the D&D sphere. Uh, you have been invited in. Come on in, buddy. You have been invited in. Come yeah. tell us your experience. So I don't know if anyone's uh, had a chance to play in an epic adventure uh, uh, and uh, at a convention, say. Uh, mm -hmm. This is where they have uh, 100 players and 25 DMs, and everyone is more or less going through the same uh, scenario, uh, and it's played over four hours and they adjust it for the different tiers. So you can have players of first, second, third, fourth tier all going through the same thing. Uh, what is interesting about it is that the players, as they go through their scenario and they uh, achieve various successes, they are allowed, they're given, and it's a random selection of different boons or banes that they can then hand out to one of the other tables that's playing. Ooh, love that. Trying to come up with a way to work this in where we split a small party, you know, just like five, four or five people, and what they're doing somehow influences what the other party can do and, and so on. With this large epic uh, session, it's, it's just kind of random and people are running around from table to table, handing them things that say for the next 15 minutes, you have a plus one on, you know, skill rolls or uh, a minus one or what have you. And uh, they're, they're doing all this, you know, and it, it's, but it's a lot of fun. There's a zillion people in the room. They're all kind of working towards the same thing, but also trying to be the first ones there. And, uh, it's just a, an interesting idea. If you have, you know, multiple DMs or some way to to do it, I it's such yeah. a was for me a unique thing when I first did it. Uh, I just thought I'd share that. No, that that's super awesome. I actually read something about this the other day. I was reading an article um, uh, about a D and D con where they where they had something very similar. They had like a bunch of different tables, a bunch of different GMs, and it was a castle siege. Each party was, you know, a different separate unit kind of on the battlefield that was, you know, taking on a role within this larger castle siege. And like you said, GMs are passing notes back and forth, you know, the banes and the boons and all this kind of stuff. Um, sounds amazing. Uh, truly, I would love to run something like that. Um, I would love to play in it, but God, would I love to run something like that. That sounds like, oof, that sounds like a challenge. That, that, oh man, I want to step up to the plate and try and meet Matt. I can see you like if, fucking vibing yeah. with it as well. What's your thoughts, dude? I was gonna say, no, I mean, I've, I've never done anything like that. That sounds both chaotic and beautiful at the same time. I think what I have done is uh, like a constantly flowing D&D session where DMs drop in and out, but players also drop in and out and it's just this map that just unfolds and unfolds and unfolds 
and you just keep playing through and that can last for hours. I think we were doing it for a day while we were running a live stream, uh, doing some other stuff, uh, different tabletop games. And in between the breaks, you just go drop in, play for a little bit or DM for a little bit and then drop out. So mm. not quite what you're talking about there, but similar. But yeah, hell yeah. You want to get 25 DMs and 100 players in a room? I'm there. Uh, dude, I'm sold. I'll be right there. Uh, you you let us know when it's happening and me and Matt will be there. Dude. Yeah. We're, we're, we're sold on that experience. 100%. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate it. That's a super sick one. Again, wasn't expecting to hear that tonight. Thank you for sharing no. that. Hell yeah. I'm going to drop you back into the audience. I appreciate that insight so, so much. That was dope. Um, right. We I believe we had one more hand up. Yeah, we've got Chaotic. Come on, Chaotic. Come on in and tell us what's going on. You are currently muted. There you go. Awesome. Yep. There we go. Uh, I, to go on, to like add on to the idea of like asking mm. uh, your players questions, you can ask them more leading questions about like the scene, such as like if a player has gone off by themselves, uh, mm -hmm. you can describe the, the, the place as being really spooky and scary. But then you re ask the rest of the group about what about them? What signs are in the scene that makes this player think that they're being watched right now? Mm. And then as each detail gets added on, it builds up the tension in the scene. I've also liked uh, like pulling the table about like consequences for important roles about like a uh, player uh, player X, you're rolling the dice, but however, everyone else gets to say what they think could go wrong. And I, as a GM, also offer my input. So, like... Hell yeah. That's awesome. And I love that. Like like, like you said, you know, adding in that, that ability to have the players have a bit more of the GM agency to, to kind of battle mm -hmm. the story. And I love how you mentioned the leading questions as well. It sounds like you've got a real good hold of your GM table and you're doing an absolute badass job. I'll tell you that. If you were my GM, I would be stoked if you were doing that kind of stuff at the table. That sounds super, super dope. And I am jelly beans of all of your players, massively jelly beans of all your players. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank no, no, you're doing awesome. Please, yeah, please. Thank you for sharing that. And I fully agree. It doesn't just have to be What's the outcome? It can be, you know, like you said, more suggestive questions and things like that. So really great point for everyone listening as well. When we were talking about that C Mike special, that Carmichael special of, uh, of giving the agency to your players, adding those leading questions in there and, and asking your question, your, your players, you know, things that are almost, a, you know, a little bit more tease where you as the GM keep the reins, but you uh, you kind of let it lax a little bit more and you, 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 you let your players grab a hold a, a little bit. Love that, Chaotic. Thank you so much for chiming in. You, you, you absolute legend. Um, and dropping back out themselves. I didn't even need to do anything. Love that. Absolute Discord legend. Discord Pro at the same time. Yeah, Discord Pro. Love that. Love that, love that, love that. Right, guys. We are coming up to our next little section. Um, and this one involves our activity for the evening. I know we've been having all this conversation and going back and forth and sharing stories and all this stuff, but we've got an activity for you guys um, and we're super, super hyped about that. So the next thing that we're going to talk about, um, excuse me, is um, the objective, uh, the player's objective during a combat encounter. So. When you design a combat encounter, we're thinking about not just you falling into the trap, uh, sorry, falling into the trap of going, oh, whack-a-mole, defeat these enemies, move on. That is a common trap that even I, uh, even Matt, even Matt Mercer, even Brennan Lee Mulligan, uh, you know, even Chris Perkins fall into the trap of, I'm just going to put some monsters in front of you so that you have to fight something in this moment, instead of uh, actually thinking about a fun objective for the players during a combat encounter. So uh, it's another super easy way to create fun and, and just a, a little bit of like diversity in, in that moment. You know, if your players have an objective during their combat encounter that isn't just kill the thing that's in front of them, it again makes them think outside of the box. How can I use my spells? How can I use my action economy? How can I use my movement? How can I do my various things? How can I role play with the other characters on my team to achieve the objective that we're looking to achieve in this combat? Um, so 
This is, uh, I wanted to quickly give out some examples that uh, I did a little bit of research because I actually find this one of the harder things to do as a GM myself. I find this one often hard and often I find myself sat there going, hmm, what's the fun objective, Bodhi? Come on now, come on, pull it out of your ass, come on. You can do it, um, and uh, and sometimes it comes to me. Other times, it definitely does not. It definitely does not. Uh, but here are some awesome examples that I think are great ones that you guys can use at your table. Um, and then I want to ask to hear if you guys have any other quick little examples. We won't have people raise hands for this next one because I want to dive into the activity. Um, and we've been here for a good two hours already. Which, by the way, guys, thank you for sticking around. This has been super Lovely. super sick. Um, but here are some good examples. So, um, players that are doing a combat while racing towards an objective, you know, think the speeder race in the, in the prequel Star Wars movies kind of thing. Um, you know, think Mad Max kind of situation where you're in this kind of race to achieve an objective while this combat's kind of going on. That's a super, super fun one. Then a time-based objective while your players are in combat. So it could be, we need to find the page, the correct page that has the ritual, and then we need to read out the ritual and do it properly, but we're running out of time. Cool, that's a super sick one. While your players are having to defend the person who's reading the page and make sure that they're able to do the ritual, that becomes a very fun combat encounter as well. Now, a moral decision during a combat encounter. So should we save them? You know, you see a bad guy hanging off a ledge and he's like, help me, I promise I'll give you the information that you need. Ooh, ooh, are we gonna save him? Are we, are we just gonna let him die? Cause this guy's been fucking with us for sessions. Are we gonna just let him die? So a moral objective and a moral decision objective during the combat is a great one. Now this one's one of my personal favorites. I love this one a lot. The protect the VIP objective. So during a combat encounter, you have an NPC or a creature that is with the party that the party are trying to protect from an onslaught of enemies. A good example of this would be taking a young princeling and trying to help them uh, escape um, for uh, escape a castle as the castle is being sieged. That's a super, super fun one. That's super, super interesting. Um, then this one is a bit more of a classic um, and is one that's a bit more traditional. This one is take out the leaders because they keep sending waves of minions your way. You're fighting these little minions. For example, a great example is the first, I think it's either the, I think it's the second session of Fantasy High by Dimension 20. They have the big corn ooze monster that's pooping out these little corn cuties as, as they ended up being called instead of corn gremlins as, as Brendan, Brendan wanted them to be called. And they realized they had to take out the big guy, not the little minions, while, you know, obviously dealing with the minions, they were aiming for the leader. So take out the leader. That's a great objective to, to try and tackle. Now this one you have to be careful with, and I think it's one that you should again mention in a session zero before the session, talk to your players about this, make sure everyone's okay and understands how this is going but a hostage situation. We love a good bank heist with hostages. We love a good situation like that, where you've got to try and make sure that the people that are being held hostage, held hostage <laughs> are kept alive and are taken out of the situation safely. So that's a super, super fun objective to try and use as well, as long as everyone in your party is okay with that. And then finally, this is one that I've not seen done for a very, very long time, but I did see it once, um, and I'm a big, big fan of this one. It's the defend the fortification, survive the waves of enemies. So for example, you're in the castle that's being sieged by 25 different uh, DMs and 100 different players, and surviving the onslaught that is coming towards you, having to go to the battlements and move you know, players here and, you know, do all these different things. That's a super fun one. Very similar to, you know, Call of Duty Zombies or, you know, like the Halo survival mode and, and, and things like that. You know, that's an exceedingly fun one where you're having to deal with these waves, fortify things, you know, use artillery and stuff to defend um, some sort of location, building um, or place, basically. It could be ruins, could be a temple, could be, you know, various different things. Um, we actually used this one now that I think about it, we actually use this one in our Avatar The Last Airbender actual play series that we did at Homie and the Dude. If you're a fan of that, it is only four episodes, and I strongly recommend checking out. It's some of the, 
some of my proudest D and uh, well TTRPG work is we were playing the uh, the uh, the Magpie uh, TTRPG of Avatar: The Last Airbender. But we had a siege moment where there was just an onslaught of Firebenders coming to attack one of the air temples, and it was just our players trying to deal with this moment and trying to engage with this massive army that's coming to get them. Super dope. Love that one. Was a huge huge fan of of that objective. So. Uh, assassin missions can be very fun as well, says Matt in the chat. Go on, Matt. Do you have any other well, examples on your end? I was going to say that was based off Chaotic's example there of killing a specific mm. target without getting caught, getting in, doing something, getting out. Those sort of stealth missions are yeah. always, they always raise the stakes because if you get caught, yeah, you're screwed. Um, I think I was just listening back to some of your examples there, and that final one about defending the fort almost takes me back to some of what I've read about some of the early editions of D&D, &D where you leveled up to eventually where you were running armies, not just running characters, and that was yeah. the game. Uh, yeah. And then it had turned into almost Warhammer-like esque um, tabletop role-playing games, if you like. But there, that's a lot of fun. I think we've we've done quite a few different things and there's been some great examples already called out uh, earlier in the session around this that idea of the trial so yes there's yeah. an enemy that keeps coming and attacking you but the only way to defeat that is to go and solve a puzzle at the same time and i personally love doing this is putting puzzles in encounters so that there are then multiple different things the players have got to think about uh, mm -hmm. and overcome before they complete that encounter it's not just kill all the creatures there's also this puzzle you have to solve. Um, we did this in campaign one with four different shrines, if you like, or four different under underground temples which were devoted to different elements. And yes, okay, you had to defeat the monster, but or the creature, I should say, but it's also what's the puzzle you got to solve to actually solve and unlock this and get that trial completed. Um, 100%. So that's always another, another good example as well. That, that was a great ideas. callback. That was a great callback to something that was mentioned earlier. I fully agree. When that came up earlier, I was like, I think it was Awesome that actually said that, who is now left. So shout out to Awesome for that amazing, that amazing little tidbit there. Cause I think that was that's super, super sick. I love, I love that very, very much. Um, guys, um, we're not gonna do raise the hand because we're gonna dive into an activity in a second, but please get into your uh, get into the chat and let us know of other kind of examples like Chaotic just did and um and Celtic Knot just did as well, of other kind of objectives that you think would be very interesting, um, you know, kind of moments for players to engage with and, and things like that. We had Chaotic saying, kill a specific target without getting caught because you can't fight everyone without getting overwhelmed. Love it. Like a ballroom scene where you need to poison someone and get in and get out. Ooh, that sounds amazing kind of situation. Uh, we've got Celtic Knot saying, in a homebrew campaign I'm in, my character and one other are nobles, and our DM had our family send troops to command, uh, send us troops to command in one encounter. Sick. Love that. That is dope. That is so, so dope. That is amazing. I am a big, big fan. Uh, then we've got uh, Tom mentioning uh, that last one sounds like the, uh, the battle at Helm's Deep in Lord of the Rings. Completely agree, Tom. And then we have some buffoonery from Matt and Tom saying, you'll have to toss me. Don't tell the elf, uh, which is some of the most quoted lines from Lord of the Rings uh, ever. Love that scene so, so much. Um, Mick, up. thank you for chiming in, dude. I know that you're kind of driving and in the middle of stuff, so I really appreciate you chiming in saying, uh, Night of the Living Dead, Farmhouse, any number of variations, third-party products out there as well. Uh, always fun, boarding up the windows, uh, disabling siege uh, machine or monster. Love it. Yeah, exactly. The, just the onslaught of Night of the Living Dead is sick. You know, that whole zombie thing? Awesome. Big, big fan. Uh, Dre saying, uh, stop something from happening within a certain time limit. Like the party has a week to travel to a base and stop the BBEG from taking it uh, six day, uh, taking six days to get to the base. Beautiful. Love that. Uh, a Almost a mixture of the race and the time base objective. Putting both of those together. Love it, Drake. Kick ass. Kick ass. Oh, I like there that we go. suggestion as well from there we Chaotic go. there. Mix, mixing the objectives. An invisible boss sending out the minions, but you've then got to perform the ritual to reveal them and then defeat it. So all of the examples coming together. 
Uh, Love yes, that. like the name says, chaotic. That is chaotic. That is brilliant. That that is chaotic. And you know what? Chaotic really showing some 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 prowess as a GM with your thinking right now. I'm really appreciating these insights from you, chaotic. You're doing an awesome job with these tonight. Everyone is providing such sick insight. I'm learning tonight, guys. Like I'm learning, which is something I, I never expected was going to happen tonight. As I thought I was just going to be talking and we were going to be interacting. But man, I'm learning so much from you guys. Thank you for all the amazing insights that you guys are providing at the moment super super dope um okay right let's move on to our activity for the evening everyone now currently we have 10 of you in the chat which i love 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 thank you guys for being here by the way super super appreciate it what we're going to do is split you guys into two parties of five we're going to split you guys, very talking about splitting the party, we're going to split you guys into two parties of five. And then we're going to have you guys jump into, as you can see within, I, I, I hope you guys can see, if not, I can always send uh, invites for, for you guys to join. But there should be some voice group chats. Oh, we just had another person join. Amazing. We'll do one group of six and one group of five. Um, we have very different group voice channels for you guys to jump into. So we're going to split you guys into two groups. And I'd love you to then hop into uh, these voice channels. And within that, I would love you guys basically to create a creative and diverse combat encounter using possibly one of the above examples that we just gave, uh, one that someone else gave in the chat, or multiple, like Chaotic said, using multiple of these objectives to create a super interesting combat encounter. Now, these are the rules. You guys are going to have about 10 minutes or so to create this combat encounter as a team. And then after that, we'd love you to come back in. We'll bring in your whole team. We'll invite the entire team to come up. And we want you guys to present this uh, combat encounter to everyone and to kind of give us an idea of what your combat encounter is going to be. You'll have a couple of minutes to present it to the group. And here's a couple of other little rules that we're going to have. We'd love one person to open some sort of Word document, note file, um, you know, Libre document or whatever you guys use to, to, to take notes. And we want one of the people in the group to be selected as the note taker so that we have an actual encounter built in note form for everyone because we're actually going to be collecting these at the end and giving it to everyone. So you all have some awesome encounters to run as one shots or things like that in the future as well. So uh, we'd like one person to be the note taker, and then we would like one person in each group to be the main person who is doing the presentation. However, during the presentation section, we would very much appreciate if every person in the party got a chance to say something. Now, obviously, some people, like I said, aren't as comfortable talking, you know, like I know, Tiger, you haven't jumped in and said anything, things like that. So if you're not comfortable talking, that is totally fine. You can opt out of that, which is why we've got one main speaker for each group in hopes that we can have someone uh, who's brave enough to, to, to go ahead and do it. But we'd love all of you to have maybe like talk about one section of this encounter and kind of give us some of the details. Now, these are the things that we're looking for, guys. We want an objective for the players or multiple objectives for the players during the combat encounter. We want to know what are the motives of the creatures or enemies that are going to be involved in the encounter. And I will write this list, by the way, in the chat so you guys can refer to this. Uh, we want to know what environment or environments um, will this encounter take place in and what effects will that environment have on the combat. Then, we would love to know any other fun little creative things that you guys have added. For example, like you're like, we're going to try and split up the party during this encounter, or we're going to negate magic for this encounter by using an anti-magic field. That's part of the, you know, that's part of the environment and terrain. So any other little fun tidbits that are going to uh, adjust this encounter, we'd love to hear about those. And then the final two things that we want to know are the key obstacles for the players to overcome, and what difficulty of party you believe this encounter is for. So, you know, kind of using that like, oh, this is probably for like a party of level sevens or like a party of level threes or, you know, a party of level twenties, you know, <laughs> however big and grandiose or, or, or small and, uh, and, and rudimentary you go. We would love to know about that. So 
Um, should we split the teams, Matt? Should we should we create our our parties? Yeah, I think just before we do that as well, not that I need to remind folks, but just a reminder of those those rules that we, we pointed at the beginning. Please yeah, be respectful you. of each other. Please give each other that time to uh, to speak and contribute. Um, not that I need to say that to this group because you're all amazing, but just a quick reminder. So, yeah, uh, how do we want to do this then? How many do you know what? have got? 11. I'm no, going to... Four and two groups of three, or... Groups yeah, let's do five, it. Yeah, but... let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do uh, exactly that. And Matt, you're going to be the guy to choose. You're, you're, you're going you're gonna to let people know <laughs> what group they're in. Um, and I'm going to just put all of this into the chat for everyone, all the different little bits that we're, we're looking for in this one. That's cool. So I am going to butcher some Discord names here, so you're going to have to forgive me straight away. Um, but why don't we go uh, Beetle Mouse, Drake... Tiger and chaotic in one room. In, in group, group one. one. Group one. So and you guys then... go hop over into group one and get started. Your time has begun. Go, go, go. <laughs> and then if we put Maven, uh, I think that's the nerdy maker there. Is that the nerdy maker? Yes, the nerdy maker and adrenaline overload into group two. Group two. Awesome. You guys head on over to group two and get planning. And then the rest of you can go into group three. So the cat, Tom, Celtic Knot, and Mick, if you all head over into group three. And there we go. Amazing. Nerdy, you are in group two. Head on over to group two. Um, and I forgot to mention that you and I will go and we'll dip into those groups and we'll go see what's going on. We'll go, uh, we'll, uh, cool. we'll, we'll, we'll go. We'll go drop in in a minute to see what's happening. What is up, dude? There we go. And there's some. There's already some really interesting ideas going on in there. It's it's a lot of fun. So. Sick. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go in. I'll I'll be back in a minute. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> no right. worries, bud. Cool. Um. Um. Hello, hello. How's it going in here, guys? How are we doing? We're we're building. Doing we're building. Great. We're, we're, uh, yeah. I feel like we we're we're working on something that I think is going to be pretty good. Yeah. Um. Um. Celtic Knot has brought in a uh, something that they've used before in a one shot. Oh. And now we're just kind of looking through all of your li your list of uh, of different things that we can consider and kind of almost um, improve fill it on out. it. And, yeah, improve on it a little bit. Oh, so I love way. that. I love I love it when people better my ideas. That's that's the way. That is the way. <laughs> um, do For do sure. we know do we know who's going to be the 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 speaker? Who's who's taking notes? Who's taking notes? Who's doing most of the talking? Have you guys worked that out? Yeah. No. It, I'm taking I'm taking notes. Um, we haven't really decided who's going to do cool. most of the speaking yet. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, I won't burden you guys with much too much time. Hey, um, Phoenix as well. Get in there, dude. I I know it might be one of those things you might not want to partake in too much. If that's the case, that is totally fine. Feel free to uh, if you want to drop some messages in the chat. There is a chat for this channel as well. You can press the little icon. Um, when you look at group three, you can press the little icon that says open chat. If you want to type things and not have to uh, vocally interact, that's totally fine. Otherwise, guys, I'll leave you to it. Uh, give, give me a quick, give me a quick one-line sentence. Give me an elevator pitch. Where, where are we going? Where are we headed? We are uh, rescue, rescuing the daughter of a nobleman from the court mage who has kidnapped her. Oh, sounds dope. I love it. Okay, cool. I'll leave you guys to it. I'll be back. I'll be back. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. All right. Awesome. Oh. Hello, 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 my wonderful lot in here. What is going on? How's everyone doing? So we've got a general theme uh, and two monsters. Awesome. Uh, awesome. 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 I'm hype. Uh, have you guys chosen a note taker who's like keeping track of everything that you guys are writing down? Yeah, I am. I'm typing stuff. Amazing. I don't really know what I'm typing, but <laughs> it's You're... all over my head, but it's totally fine. You're nailing it. I'm sure you're nailing it. So, okay, I, I won't burden you guys too much because I'm sure you're in the flow and I don't want to break that up too much. Give me a one-line elevator pitch of what, what this encounter is going to be. Uh, so far, all we've got figured out is that it's on a mountainside. It involves a Dow and an Earth Elemental Myrmidon. Ooh, that sounds awesome, guys. Yep. Hell yeah, these are some sick ideas. Amazing, guys. Well, hey, I'll leave you to it. Keep churning away, and I'll come let you know when your time is coming to an end. Great job, though, guys. I will be right back. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Right. Thank you. All right.
So, yeah. oh, flying rules are so annoying to work with in D&D. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I say as someone who's done a sky Focus campaign, uh-huh. they are so annoying to work with. Mm-hmm. What an uh, what an amazing little group this is! I love all the cameras that are on and that everyone's interacting. This is warming yeah, yeah, yeah. my heart. Hello, I've everyone. Got, I've got mascot behind me. <laughs> amazing. Can I, right. can I pitch something real quick? Yes, go, um, go for it. It's a what if it is like a bunch of rope bridges and then there's maybe like oh. a lava pit or something. So yeah, I mean, you... people can just choose to fight or cut down a rope bridge and see what happens. Mm. That's super dope. Okay, let me just quickly ask. Have you guys got a note taker? Is someone taking notes? Yes. yes. Amazing. Okay. Um, this group yeah. seems very organized. I, I, I'm, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to get involved very much at all. I'll let you guys stay in the creative flow. The final question I have for you guys is, give me a one-line elevator pitch. What direction are we heading with this encounter so far? Give me an elevator pitch, guys. Um, it's... Uh... A sports game that the party is competing in, and there is a bookie who is trying to thwart them winning the game so he doesn't lose his shirt. That is yeah. dope. As as a fan of mixed martial arts, uh, I love a good sporting event, and I love a good bit of betting on a sporting event. That's super dope, guys. Love the idea. Love it, love it, love it. Right. I'm going to hop back into the stage and I'll be back to let you guys know when your time is running out. Keep turning away, guys, and I'll be back in a little bit. Yeah. Dope, though. Good. Super, super dope. Right. Yeah, in a bizzle, guys. On your point on rope bridges, because... Um, Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Damn. Dude, one group has all got their cameras on. Oh, my little heart. My amazing, little heart. No, oh. I'm loving, loving the collabs there. So. Don't, dude. Everyone's doing so awesome. It's so nice to hear everyone just uh, really working as a team and uh, and and getting the getting stuck into it, dude. It's, it's freaking dope. We'll give them like another like five minutes and then I'll go start being like, right, guys, two minute counter on, like. Get 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 it get your last bits on the paper and get ready to present and and we'll rush them back over. For anyone who is watching this uh, post haste, um, the 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 rewatch back through. Um, this has been amazing. We'd love to see loads of you kind of join this. I know that the timings don't always work and things like that, but um, you know, we're hoping that the more people that come to this, the more amazing and the more it will grow. But that also being said, the more of you that come, the more unruly this gets and the more wild it gets. So we'll uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But uh, honestly, this has been just spectacular. I've loved every minute of this. Y- you could tell by Matt's face a second ago when we were talking about it that this has just been phenomenal we're so thankful for for all these amazing people that have been here tonight and have joined us so if you're interested in being part of one of the homie and the dude workshops in the future please 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 uh keep your eye keep your ears peeled and your eyes ready uh for any sort of notifications where we'll be doing that we'll be addressing loads of other topics i'm sure we'll get into things like rp planning sessions, uh, first time being a GM. Um, Also things like, for example, I have a decent amount of experience within acting and improvisation. So we'll definitely dive into some topics like that. And then I would actually love to hear some topics that you guys would be interested in learning a little bit more about. So if you find yourself in a place where you wanna let us know about a topic that you're like, oh man, you know, I would really love to learn a little bit about this. And maybe it's a topic I don't know loads about. I promise you I'll go do a bunch of research and I'll bring you what I have and what I can possibly do uh, for you guys. Um, On top of this, Matt and I will be running these together going forward, but we are hoping to bring in some guest speakers um, in the future as well, some people um, that would be happy to give us their insight in topics that I'm not proficient in, topics that Matt isn't proficient in, um, and and kind of give people a little bit more uh, of advice and things like that in areas that we maybe aren't as good at. Things like, you know, being a you know super professional YouTube D and D person that does shorts as opposed to like actual plays, uh, it might be you know writing D and D content for Kickstarters. It might be you know uh, it might be uh, running games for you know a hundred players. You know where you've got twenty five GMs. 
I would love to kind of expand uh, the the group of people that are that are really kind of uh, bringing the most to this, um, bringing the most to these groups and uh, and, and what they can provide in terms of information. Because while I claim to be a, a very good dungeon master, you know, I I also understand that there's people that are far more proficient and places that I need to practice and learn and improve on as well. So we'll see. Uh, we'll definitely have a look and see. Um, down the line, uh, if we can get any kind of guest speakers to come in and, and share some of their uh, maybe more specific niche or, or, or specified kind of, uh, you know, insights into some of these topics. But we're coming up to letting our players know that they need to hop back into the stage. So I'm going to give them another minute and then I'm going to run through the groups and I'm going to say the two minute warning countdown has begun. I will show them my phone with a little countdown timer going as well. And I'll tell them that they've got two minutes to finalize their ideas um, and bring it all together because we are actually we're pushing the three hour mark. We're at two hours and 30 minutes on this bad boy and it has been incredible, incredible. Um, and, uh, and that has been, that, that's amazing. I can't believe we, we, we ran for this long and it's been like, oh, you just, uh, incredible. You caught me at a, at a very <laughs> interesting moment there, Matt. <laughs> that's all good, buddy. <laughs> uh, I'm just talking to myself okay. and anyone who may be watching this post haste. Um, uh, post nice one. Yeah, it was me sat in silence. Yeah, that's going to look really awkward. I didn't think about that one. No, uh, I sat in I sat in silence for the first bit as well, so I'm actually gonna, when I take this out, I'm gonna cut out my silence, then cut out your silence, and then just cut back in this tiny bit where I've been talking. <laughs> and that's it, awesome. basically. Awesome. <laughs> I have a little, uh, li little bits about it, but yeah. Um, God, dude, this is, I, I, I was, I'm just like, I was just saying like, one, this has worked so well. Two, it's yes. awesome to see everyone collaborating and, and hopefully to see this grow and have people who can come to these, um, you know, it might be something as well that you and I, you know, start off doing it this time and then maybe in the future try diversifying our time schedule so that we can get other people, you know, make it a weekend thing, you know, when people are a bit more free, you know, see what fits kind of into your and my schedule to see if we can get new people who have never had a chance to because of work or, you know, time zones or things like that to be able to do it. Um, Same. And then the other thing, dude, is like, let's get some guest speakers because as I was saying a second ago, you and I are smart and we're good dungeon masters, but there's people who know stuff about, you know, writing books for Kickstarter, you know, marketing yeah, your yeah. Kickstarter book, you know, being a D and D shorts creator, you know, doing, you know, all these different things that you and I have very little proficiency in. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't put our stat numbers in those areas at all. Um, nah, you know, nah, so I think that would be cool. That. Yeah, for sure. Oh man. Dude, what a fucking pleasure this has been. What an incredible group of people. What what just like Indeed, a super mate. dope group of people. Um, I love the right. diversity in that as well. So much diversity in that group. I know, right, dude? Just like, just so many people coming from so many different angles. It's yeah. fucking great. It's so, so great. Right. I'm going to go give them the two minute count. I'm going to, I'm going to go into <laughs> the first group and I'm going to show my two minute timer has started. I'm going to do it for for each group and put them on edge. <laughs> and no. then I'll probably give them a little we'll bit longer than two minutes. You've got a timer. Yeah, exactly. No, awesome. Exactly. Right, I'll be back in a second. No worries, bud. In that hidden room. And in in fact, you know, kind of almost like Hello. trick them into thinking, oh, we just, we just messed up and now um, they're dead. So um, some, somehow like have an element of surprise where they're they're not um they're not sure whether they've actually messed up or not yes <laughs> yeah. hello. hello everyone hello hello i'm here to tell you that your two minute timer has begun continue <laughs> with your work and i shall be back in two minutes everyone get your last yeah. notes on the paper get preparing and uh, your two minute timer has officially begun i will be back soon Bye. Okay. Can I say? <laughs> Wallstone and Polymorph. Let's see those three uh, spells. What spell? My... Let's see. Polymorph. Polymorph. Wallstone. Hello, move everyone. Earth. And move Earth. Hello, oh, team hello. group two. Oh. I am hey. here as your cordial, uh, cordial leader of the workshop to tell you your two-minute timer 
has officially begun. You have two minutes to get your notes onto your paper and finalize your encounter. I will be back in two minutes to come and get you guys to re-enter the stage. Thank you guys, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye. Alrighty then. Bye. Oh. Ah. Hello, 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 wonderful camera team of group one. How is everyone doing? Good. Good. Uh, yeah. we've, we've narrowed it down quite a bit, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I am here to let you know that your two minute timer has begun. Get your oh, final goodness. notes on paper. Jesus. Get your final ideas together, guys. Start getting it together, and I'll be back in two minutes to come and grab oh, you guys. It does not feel like it's been eight minutes. You guys <laughs> have got like it. It's been eight minutes. <laughs> right, I shall be back soon. Good luck, everyone. Ta da! Oh, it does not feel like it's been eight yeah. minutes. They've actually thrown me for a bit of a loop now. <laughs> That, that spun them. That spun them, dude. That has caused absolute chaos across all the groups. That was funny as fuck. That was so funny. Right. I'm gonna go bother these people. <laughs> go be uh, go be their worst nightmare. Um, right, I'll be back. No worries, mate. Tech traps, we roll to see if we can disarm it, see what's going on, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, team, five seconds, four, three, two, one, and your timer is up, everyone. So if you can make your way back to the stage room, Matt is waiting there waiting there for you guys. If you can make your way back over to the stage room, um, I will come join you in a second. I just have to go let the others know that their timer is running out as well. Um, and I look forward <laughs> to hearing about your encounter, guys. Um, awesome stuff. Sounds like you guys have been working hard together as a team, which I love to love to love to hear. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll see you guys in a second. Amazing. Sounds good. No problem. Marathon. Trying to collect gems. Hello, team. That's 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And the timer is up, guys. I hope you got all the notes down. I hope We're you got good. all the stuff. Oh, that's what I like to hear. Oh, confidence. We are, horses. we are good. Hell yeah. I love We're the good. confidence, guys. Amazing. Okay. If you guys can make your way back to the stage, um, I will be back over there in a second. Matt is currently waiting over there for you guys. Um, he will greet you as you enter, and I will be there um, ASAP as well. Let me uh, quickly move on to the other group. Amazing. Ciao. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello, everyone. We have 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 2, 1, and time is okay, up, group 1. Who's going to be presenting? We never too great on that. Oh, who is your lead presenter? Have we got a uh, I, volunteer? Uh, maybe me because I wrote all the notes down. Uh, but I can also yeah, share the right. notes I've written down because I. I vote chaotic. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Up to you guys. I don't mind doing it as long as someone sends me. If you, as long as you send me the notes, chaotic. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I, I. As you. You guys have been talking. I've been writing a bunch of notes and more. More of my yeah, thoughts. You can summarize it for sure. Yeah. yeah. Super sick. Awesome, guys. This group has been amazing. I love that you've all flipped cameras on, that you guys have interacted. Can I just tell you uh, extra points for that? Though there is no <laughs> points tonight, extra points for that. I absolutely love it. Um, Make your way back over to the stage, guys. Matt is waiting for you over there, and I will be there in just a second so we can get the presentations mm -hmm. going. I will see you in just a moment, team. Right, let's head on over. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I 
I've had a lot of fun. We were just chatting while you guys were all sort of just sat in the uh, sat in the different rooms there about how much fun we're having and how awesome it's been. So, and here comes Bodhi back in. There he is. Oh, oh, oh! I'm excited. Oh, I'm I'm quaking in my boots. I'm I'm hella excited right now, Matt. I don't know about you, but this is this was super super sick uh super super dope to see all of you guys interacting with one another we had one group with cameras on and everyone like hanging out face to face which was amazing amazing to see drake saying they're just gonna make a cup of tea we'll do group one last then if drake's gonna go make a cup of tea we'll do group one last um okay let's go in reverse order then should we do group three first Let's do group three first. I'm also interested in Tiger's comment there around dance floor rules from Chaotic. So we're going to touch on that at some point. But yeah, let's go for, for group three and let's see what's been uh, created. I will invite you all up to the stage and you can um, all come and talk at once. Uh, you can all come in, present as well. Um, I will just do that quickly, invite you to speak. And then uh, where is Celtic? There you are. And I invite you to speak in as well. Um, there we go. Group one is live. Go on, group one. Uh, main presenter, take it away, but we'd love to hear from each of you guys about the various aspects of this uh, encounter. Um, do you have a name for the encounter? Ooh, uh, Princess Heist? <laughs> Princess Heist. Love it. Dope. Super, I've super already dope. invested. Yeah, exactly. You sold me. <laughs> sold me. Yep. Okay. Go for it, guys. I'll, I'll hand over the floor to you. Over to you guys. Already. Well, uh, the others are here to help me out with this a little bit, uh, as I might have to run during the middle of this. But no uh, our concept, yeah, thank you. Our concept is there are going to be two uh, major parties. There is a nobleman and a, a mage of some sort, and there is a princess caught in between them who has a magical artifact that determines the line of succession of her crown. Uh, and the mage is actually her real father, even though she lives with the nobleman. Uh, and the party is called in by the nobleman to retrieve the princess uh, to try saving her. But while this is all happening, uh, there is also the mage's minions, who are a pair of gargoyles who have been possessed by demons uh, and are kind of a third party you can sway. Uh, on top of all of this, um, your mission as a party is to persuade the mage uh, to give the princess back. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, please, guys. Uh, or the, the maid... The idea was that... Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> the idea was that the party was asked by the, by the lord to go rescue this girl who he tells us is his daughter. Um... And uh, and that the mage kidnapped her. Mm. Yeah. Nice. And it, go ahead. And uh, and he tell he tells us that he tells the party that uh, that the mage has uh, has said that if anybody comes after them, he will kill the girl. Um, and yeah, as um, that's uh, and that's. As the party find, would may find out that uh, that that's not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. Uh, anything else? Um, there are some there are some traps along the way. So um, the mage the mage has set some traps. traps. Yeah, go, go for it, Kelty. Yeah. yeah, he's got uh, traps leading all the way up his tower, and and one around the girl herself. Um, on the way up the tower. The uh, if we if the party sets off the trap, there's a chance the mage may hear it and be alerted that somebody is coming after him, which, as the party has been told, will mean that he's going to kill the princess. Um, so if the party does set off a trap, um, the you know there's a and if the mage hears it, he sends the gargoyles after the party, and that's the party's notification that yes, he knows we're coming. So now they think the princess is dead. So what do they do now? Okay. The additional, uh, the additional elements are that the gargoyles are actually 
just interested in creating chaos. So they could create chaos for the mage or against the mage. The party doesn't know this, but that is in play. So the party could interact with the gargoyles in a way that could bring them around to being allies for them. The other thing that we wanted to do is to make this a bit of a moral dilemma. So the mage, although is on the surface a baddie, right? He's kidnapped this princess. Um, underneath the surface is she's actually his daughter and he's bringing her back to her rightful family. Um, so we don't know that as a party, but we would, if we investigated that, um, there could be some, some real dilemma on how we handle this because our motive, our objective is to rescue the daughter uh, with as little injury as possible. So there's a few layers yeah. in here that we've added to it that we're really excited mm. about. Amazing. So we're, <laughs> we're looking at a, a heist, a, 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 almost a hostage situation. We're looking at a heist. We're looking at like traps, which is amazing. We've got incredible creatures that have interesting motives. We've then got also this moral kind of dilemma that's going on across the whole thing. Um, and, uh, and just the layers of discovery here. I think my favorite thing, Matt, I'll, I'll just tune in. My favorite thing is that the traps could possibly it alert the mage and having this kind of unsureness of having to kind of sneak through but not sneak through and all this kind of stuff. I think that's awesome. That, that, that really, really hammered the nail home for me and made that one super, super dope. So I love this, guys. Matt, do you, do you have anything you want to say about this one? Yeah, no, this is this one's awesome already. So I yeah, we've we've started we've started strong, which is cool. Uh I have questions, to be honest. Like, does 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 the daughter no does the princess know she's the mage's daughter? Does she still believe she's the princess? Uh and then it's a mage, so these traps are gonna be a lot of fun. And if it, I know what I'd do if it was me, just as a just as a throw in there, if if I've got somebody that I know you're going after and I'm a mage, I'm creating illusions that are going to um... really really screw with the party so i love this idea this has got so much potential yeah hella legs Hell, hella legs whoever Thank was you. taking we, we notes oh i'm dude i'm so <laughs> stoked i'm so stoked you guys had fun as a group and when i when i hopped into the room you guys were vibing there there was some serious energy in the in in the room so that was super, super awesome to hear. Thank you guys for working so to so well together as a group. And man, what 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 an awesome encounter you guys created. Whoever was taking notes, can you please link the uh, the file? Um, can you save it on your your end and then link it into the uh, stage chat, please, so that this is then available for everyone to be able to run at their at their leisure if they so please. I got to figure out how to do that. Give me a couple of minutes and I will. <laughs> Amazing. No, no problem at all. Take your time. Sort that out. If, it, if you need to DM it to me personally afterwards, that's totally fine. I have no issue with that whatsoever. I just like to collect them all so everyone does have the ability to, uh, to, to, to do that um, as a group. Um, and I'll then correlate all of those into a folder and, and, and send it out. We've Wow. Uh, the name of the oh, second one is... Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, golly. <laughs> okay. Guys. First of all, smashed it. Awesome job as a group. You ticked all the boxes. You had multiple objectives. You had a sick environment in the tower with traps and things like that. You had lots of, you had the motives of the, the, the bad guys who have sent you, the mage himself, the gargoyles. Um, I think this is a very well-rounded well -rounded encounter. Awesome, awesome job, team. Uh, anything so else you guys want to add? The oh, yes, final Matt, question it. from me was the, the last piece of sort of the uh, the puzzle when we set the activities. What level do you think this is going to be for? Great question. Uh, we, were, we were thinking probably a, a pretty four or five level seven characters. Nice. Beautiful. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, level four, level five kind of range. We love that. Beautiful. Amazing, no, 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 guys. No, uh, level seven, sorry. I think. <laughs> Oh, it's sorry. Level five, level seven yeah, yeah. Four, five, sorry seven. about that. My nice. apologies. I misheard. My terrible hearing. I apologize, guys. Um, awesome work, team. Kick ass. Group three, kicking us off with a bang. Right. I'm going to drop you guys back into the audience and we'll grab group two. Awesome, awesome work, guys. Hell yeah. Hell, hell yeah. Exactly. Claps all around. Leonardo DiCaprio claps for everybody. Uh, <laughs> Right, group two was Maven, 
going to get you in. It was uh, The Nerdy. Um, and yep. it was, uh, was that it? No, it was. Adrenaline. Uh, adrenaline which, Overlord. Adrenaline, yeah. of course. My apologies. There we go. Um, nerdy, there you go. You are invited to speak. There we go, everyone. You are in group two. Um, do we have a name for the encounter? Uh, Maven's been calling it Nightmare <laughs> Fuel. <laughs> I like it. Yep. Yeah, I will post perfect. the pictures to explain why. Yeah, yeah. We we have oh. graphics and everything. It's oh, great. Christ. Oh, oh wow. there's the nightmare fuel. Wow! Yes. Wow! Wow! So there's wow. the reason it's called nightmare fuel. It was uh, great. Some elements. Anyway, there. right. Go for it, so, team. Get us to it. For uh, the lady with the great big uh, mall on. And floating on a cloud of sand is a Dao, for those of you unaware. They are the Earth Genies. Mm -hmm. uh, the rock creature with a Warhammer is an Earth Elemental Myrmidon, which is basically a controlled Earth Elemental. Uh, the thing that looks like a ball with teeth and eye and multiple limbs is a Zorn. They are uh, basically just... They're a small elemental... Well, not small, but... They're, uh, they're that. elemental creatures that love eating gemstones and precious yeah. metals. Uh, and the spider horse creatures uh, are Kruthix, which are, they live mm -hmm. underground. Anyway, encounter design was, uh, it is set on a mountainside uh, above or near a dwarven town. No, we did not come up with a name for the town. Uh, and <laughs> uh, the, the, so most of these creatures are famously greedy. Uh, so Dow, Zorn. Earth Elemental doesn't get a choice because it's a Myrmidon. Uh, anyway, uh, so they are after a mine run by the town, which is the source of its economy. Uh, so you have the Myrmidon, which has all sorts of lovely spellcasting. Uh, I, I think we planned on giving the... I'm sorry, the Dao has spellcasting. We added some to the Myrmidon. Yeah, he, uh, gave, it, he gave it to the Myrmidon. Yes. Um, so stuff like... Uh, Pass wall, um, phantasmal killer, which for those of you who are aware is a nasty spell. Um, those are things they have to the Dow. I think we added uh, stuff like uh, earthquake uh, for the Myrmidon. Yeah, another, like move um, earth. So. I lost the chat, um, but yeah, like move earth and stuff. Yeah, uh, and then the Zorns are intended to be slightly or slightly weaker minions. Uh, for the the Dow uh, and the Myron, uh, they're not terribly intelligent creatures. They're just there to eat gems and precious metals. Um, whereas the Dow is actually desiring them because it wants them because it's greedy, uh, and the Myron's there because it doesn't have a choice. Okay, uh, awesome. So these guys are attacking anyway, a mine the, that belongs to a village. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Yes. Uh, so. Technically, the combat, well, the, the, in, the, objective. Session, the objective does not require combat. In Ooh. theory, you could technically convince the Dao to leave. How you do that is, I'm not sure, but it's theoretically <laughs> possible. Nice. Now, I'm not sure you're ever convincing the Zorn to leave the mine alone, mm -hmm. but I'd much rather face Zorn. Uh, then a um, Myrmidon and a Dao and Zorn. Um, what about the horse spiders? Yes. And we decided, you know, let's add <laughs> some chaos. Uh, so Kruthix are the horse spider creatures that we have. The nightmare fuel. Yes. Um, and we decide, you know, all this going on, assuming it does get to combat, is probably <laughs> going to make anything that lives in the mine freak out. Um, yep. Okay. And... Yep. We decided the creatures that would be freaking out would be Kruthix, which are, they're not terribly intelligent. They're, they're monstrosities, and they're a little bit smarter than most animals. Mm -hmm. They're not like human intelligence. They're probably going, the hell is going on? Stop destroying where we live. And love you know, that. just to add some chaos. Because who doesn't love chaos in their combat encounters? Yep. Nice. Uh, mm. So for setting, we pretty much at the mountainside, and then just likely would go into the mine itself. Love uh, that. 
two environments, dope, super dope, love that. And uh, so you guys have got you guys have got objective. So is the objective to stop them stealing the jewels or destroying the mine? Yes. Or is it both? Uh, pretty much both, considering you know, it's both. mine doesn't have much use if they've stolen all the jewels, so it's effectively destroyed. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, uh, guys, let me let me just tell you, this sounds like Lost Minds of Fandelver on steroids. This sounds like something that absolutely is terrifying. Um, I imagine for the village folk, and I assume for the players, um, are they've either stopped by the village and are, are dealing with this situation, or they're from this village and are dealing with the situation. Either way, could you imagine your, your local neighborhood being <laughs> like dealing with this? Oh my god. Nightmare fuel is exactly what I would call it. Yeah, yeah, and well, we, in the we don't want to have them yeah. pay for pretty creatures. So it's yeah. a while. And you can and you can pay somebody some player to come in from absolutely left field and be like, you give me enough coin, yeah, I'll take that on. Awesome, 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 awesome. And um and uh overload, you were gonna say something. What were you about to say? Not, I think Louie. No, cool, 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 cool. Guys. This sounds super, super dope. It sounds like it's going to be a gritty battle in dark tunnels, you know, on the side of a mountainside. It sounds like this is going to get earthy. It's going to get your people moving, you know, like you said, these spells that are allowing you to cause earthquakes and alter the terrain around you all the time. So it sounds like it's going to be one of those that is a battlefield that is almost constantly shifting and constantly changing, which to that me was the goal. sounds dope. Yeah. Nice. Super dope. That is freaking awesome. You guys really cool. lent into the environment stuff and the and the, the the creatures that are involved in this. Now, what level would you say uh, you would like a party of players to be to try and deal with this uh, this freaking shit show that has rocked up to level this 18. town? <laughs> level eighteen. Uh, level eighteen show. at most. Okay. Okay. Yeah, level we, 18 we at didn't least. do anything terribly exact. We just kind of. Fitball. I think 15 is probably the minimum and 18 is probably the maximum to keep it reasonable. But we did not plug it into an encounter creator or any, anything cool. and go, nope. oh, yeah. this is the exact level necessary. Hey, encounter creators are, those are fake. Those are fake calculators as far as I'm concerned. They, th th there's not maths that you can do for that. It's a feel thing. It's a feeling thing. Exactly. I, I fully agree with you. That is exactly. Uh, so, guys, this sounds dope. I'm terrified. I would hope that as a player, I would never have to deal with this problem because, dear God, I know my first instinct would be run, and then my second one would be, okay, if I'm gonna fight this, I've gotta just fucking hunker down and hope for the best in this bad boy because that is a team of creatures that is savage. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Matt, do you wanna chime yeah. in with some stuff? I was going to say, I would actually love for a lower level, but I'd love for this to be a fixed point in your world and a lower level party to just stumble in and then go, oh, shit, uh, and run out screaming because, let's fair, it's, it's, yeah, the Nightmare Fuel, they're going to do that. But no, that is that is awesome. I loved the, the individual personalities that you thought about for the creatures there as well, and you went deep mm -hmm. into that. I loved that piece. Each creature within that has got their own motivations, their own things they're trying to do. Maybe they're just a minion who just wants to eat stuff, but still, that in itself is a great little um, dichotomy to introduce into it. So, yeah, really, really good. Loved it. Thanks. Yeah. Big, big fan, guys. Well done. Freaking some great teamwork there as well. When I was hopping in the room, you guys sound super jazzed about the idea and super excited. So I'm super stoked that you guys worked well as a team and that we ended up with this incredibly scary and wonderful encounter. Thank you guys for putting your heads together and creating that super, super dope encounter. Anything else from you guys before we, uh, we, we hear from group one? Well, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, that was awesome. Of fun. course, of course. Awesome. Hey, no, guys, it was an absolute pleasure to listen to that one. That one is super, super dope. Right, I'm gonna drop you guys back into the audience. Thank you so much, guys. That was sick. Right. Ooh, oh, oh, they doing it themselves. Look, look at these pros. Look at these I pros. Look at these pros. Right. Let's get chaotic in here. Let's get uh, let's get Drake up in here. Uh, let's get. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know what the one beginning with B is because I can't see it. What is it, Matt? 
yeah, this is the one I butchered. I don't know if it's Boytel Mouse or a uh, Butel Mouse. Or... Yeah, there, there, Boy, there you go. Boytel Mouse and Tiger as well. Let's get Tiger up in here as well. Tiger, come on in. Amazing. This this wonderful team of four all had their cameras on and were really getting stuck in together <laughs> in in their group. So, guys, do we have a name for the encounter? Uh. Well, we did not come up with a name uh, like together because like I was like trying to name it at the last minute. Uh, uh, so I came up with Sports Ball Brawl because we did not name the sports oh. game yet. Sports <laughs> Ball yeah. Brawl. It, Love it. We, we never specified the sport and it kind of worked in that favor. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This can uh, work as a one shot or be inserted into the campaign because it's such up to be like the big bad uh, is making a bet uh, with uh, the group. Uh, and there's been rumors that the that the big bad will do anything to like basically make sure this either game won't go over well or that they will win uh, mm -hmm. their bet because the players themselves are participating in a game. Uh, 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 okay. this is, uh, but however, there's been sort of a conspiracy because the ref has been making, been acting oddly, making odd calls and potentially discreetly speaking, receiving a bit of money on the side. So the party has to split up to figure out like what's going on, but also not forfeit the game. So like half the players will be in the stands making sure like, Nothing shady is going on the side, but the other half is going to be playing the game. Love it. Uh, <laughs> I just saw the comment. Yeah, I, I, when I was suggesting this, I did take a uh, leap from British football <laughs> for ideas. <laughs> Amazing. From, from my brief bits of knowledge. Incredible. Uh, so get, 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 us, get us into this one, guys. Give us a little bit of some of the juice for this one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the game itself is uh, basically uh, just sort of like to, uh, take the ball across the field, yeah. sort of types of things. Uh, but how, however, I what's you pitched it as a um, like football, but I then we we end up talking more about other sports kind of mm. thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's unique is that the game field is actually a retrofitted like pirate ship uh, like the the stadium is like all this pirate thing there is this uh ice excitement cannon that goes off every so often so no. like uh, uh and uh, uh uh but however uh like because of like how rowdy things can get the the that the, the the group running the stadium has to make thing the player uh, like the 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 crowd stays calm so like there is like sort of sleep spells on standby just in case like they get a little too rowdy but however all these things could like be the big bad could manipulate to try to cause chaos uh on the field and whatnot by release releasing the sleep spells onto the field itself or uh firing the ice uh cannon into the crowd and just like as the game goes on, it'll, the danger will ramp up more and more. So, like, you have to win the game quickly, or else people are going to be in danger. Wow, uh, amazing! Is, is is there anything else to that one, or is is that the pitch? Uh, it is, we talked about a few different ideas. Yeah, that, it oh, is so many ideas that cool. we couldn't possibly put them all into one game. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> yeah. about right. That sounds. That sounds the last. It sounds like you're designing in a carry on tiger. Rating points for judges. We forgot about the judges there, but there's judges there if you want to win that way as well. Ooh, love that. Love that. I like Go on, it. Matt. Okay. I was going to say, it sounds like you started to build an encounter and went on and built a campaign. So that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Not <laughs> intent. <laughs> but the birth of a great little homebrew campaign there or a series of encounters there. Loved it. That is, that is. Awesome. One, one thing I suggest is the um, that the uh, big bad is also using message cantrip to basically send send little insulting messages to people throughout the crowd, getting them riled mm. up to cause like a riot um, in nice. the stands. Love that. I, do you know so it is literally half the half teams doing the game, while the other half are uh, like investigating. I love that. So let's let's talk about some layers here. Let's talk about some some of the layers going on. So we've got um, we've got the amazing 
terrain, which by the way, um, I have, uh, <laughs> I have many different like, uh, parts of my, my world cause it's set in the sky centered around airships. I have a lot of that, like, uh, like shanty town pirate ships combined together kind of stuff. I love that. That's super dope. Um, I think then I love the idea that the, the BBG is trying to fix this. He's trying to, you know, like manipulate the situation. Sounds very Legend of Korra um, esque, I would say. Not which intentional. Is very, <laughs> Not intentional, but that would be bad. Very yeah. cool. Very cool. I'm a big, big fan of that because I love the uh, love the sporting game in that. Um, love that you guys created this kind of event um, and that the encounter is centered around an event and stuff going on. I love that we split the party. We've got investigating. We've got competing going on. Very thought out, guys. I love the depth that you guys went to with this one. And like Matt said, it sounds like you guys have got a campaign to run between the four of you that one of you needs to grab the DM chair and start running a campaign because that sounds no, super, I'm, super I'm dope. already DMing one campaign. I don't want to DM another one at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, but guys, I just have to say um, at the sports thing as well is something that I feel like in D&D can be a, be a hit or miss, and I feel like when it's done right, and from what you guys described, sounds like it would be done very much right, um, is something that can add so much to a period of possibly downtime, or you know, possibly, like you said, this deeper kind of finding out more information, trying to understand why this is being fixed and all that kind of stuff. I love it. Huge fan. You guys sold me from fucking Jump Street um, with the name, so I think very, very well done on my behalf, guys. This this sounds dope as hell. I would be so keen to 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 run something like this for some players, um, especially with the whole fixing stuff. Like uh, Tom and I are big MMA fans. We love uh, the UFC and boxing and things like that. And there's always speculation of was that fight fixed? Did they take a flop? You know, there's always speculation. So I'm a big fan of that. Big, big, big fan. Matt, do you have anything else you want to add? Yeah, I think the other thing I liked about this one is it's the one that's... Uh, I know we had a couple where they called out that combat was not the object, but here, combat was not even mentioned at all. It was a case of, mm. here's your situation, here's what you've got to deal with, go and deal with that how you will. Um, mm. So I actually really enjoyed that because it's down to the party here to decide, do we just go and smash the referees across the head? Do we go straight to the BBEG? Do we try and work our way through the crowd silently, keeping things calm while we eventually get to the BBEG? It's, it was one, great. One, one thing I said during um, like the discussion was that while uh, half the party doing the investigative thing if I was running, I'd have um, the players on the f who were on the field just rolling D100 something to see how well they played. Yeah. Mm. While also like moving them on the map, see how they how well they're playing. Hell yeah! You can you have know, the bar. Some performance checks. You can. I was about to say you can have the bar trying to like yeah 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 you you knew it Matt you knew it. <laughs> exactly our our brain went to the same place yeah yeah exactly. Um, Awesome, guys. Uh, I just have to say, well, well done. I really appreciated that you guys were all on camera as well. It was great to see that level of interaction. Obviously not expected from any group, but um, just appreciate it. And I just have to say, guys, across the board, absolutely dope. Right, if you guys don't mind, those of you who can, jumping back into the audience, I'll put the rest of you back into the audience. No problem uh, uh, if, if it's not your thing. Um, but uh, I, I go for it. Uh, leave now uh, i have to pick up a friend at the airport but thank oh. you all so much uh my group it was great to work with you and thank Same you for this. really appreciate the whole thing got some ideas it's really wonderful and i'm looking forward to interacting on your discord channel so take Hell care yeah. everybody we, we can't wait to have you interact as well, dude. And we've got a couple more things that we're going to touch on. So check out the last little bit of this episode uh, post haste, you know, when you got some time. But hey, we appreciate you being here so much, man. Thank you for taking the time. Right. No problem at all. Sweet. Awesome. Right. I'll move you guys back down into the... Oh, everyone's... everyone's uh, oh, there you go. I, I, yeah, just... This, Absolutely this, love it. Team one on it. Absolutely on it. So <laughs> first of all, guys, activity... Amazing. You guys all smashed out of the park. I'm blown away by the creativity, the level of teamwork, the thought processes that you guys went through. Um, just so proud of all of you guys for, for, for the work that you just put in and so thankful for uh, the time that you guys all just put in as well. Absolutely incredible. Um, 
I'll give you a quick little rundown of kind of what's left in this workshop. Um, uh, no problem, Chaotic. This has been incredible. Thank you for joining us. We've enjoyed you being here very, very much. Um, we look forward to hopefully having you back soon. Again, like I said, we'll have a couple more things that we're going to address here. And if you want to check those out um, in the recording, we'd love you to. Uh, love to hear your insight in the comments and things like that. Um, but thank you for, for joining us, Chaotic. It's been awesome to have you. Um, cool. Uh, guys, couple little things that we're going to touch on. The, the, the last little bit of this uh, is basically we're going to touch on some team up, player team up moves. We're going to touch on, um, we're going to touch on GM realistic descriptions, movement and RP every turn of combat. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, GM using a enemy group, a group of enemies as, uh, as a party of players in a weird way. And then finally, we're going to talk about GM post-combat consequences. Now, people are starting to um, kind of move out and, and come to the end of this thing. So I'm going to try and speed up this last little section for you guys. We'll try and uh, chug through some of this stuff um, for sure so that you guys get it. But some of this last section is some awesome stuff to help you guys. So keep your ears peeled and your eyes ready um, as, uh, as we dive into this last little section and then we'll do a little goodbye at the end of all of it. And that'll be, uh, and that'll be us guys. Um, but yes. So after we just did combat objectives, uh, objectives during a combat and different objectives, the next thing that we're looking at is realistic descriptions and movement and RP in every round of combat. Now, these are two separate things, but they kind of all meld together into one kind of area. Now, for anyone who's new or who's looking to enhance their combat uh, very quickly, this is actually one of the most commonly used methods and also is one of the simplest ways uh, to do so um, and, and make sure that you guys are, are able to kind of make that more immersive kind of creative feel. Yes, Kaz, we will 100% be giving out... Um, uh, little handouts at the end of all of this for everyone so you can have all of the information as well as also the recorded video. Um, so let's dive in first to realistic descriptions because this is something that I think a lot of people are afraid to do and are afraid to kind of dive into but it's really simple when you kind of break it down into what you're actually looking at here. Um, so realistic descriptions are thinking about describing your actions uh, or spells every time you do something and using logic to kind of think about how this action spell would both look and work when you use it, basically. Um, so with that being said, um, I kind of broke this into two main kind of areas, basically. The first one is what I call the anime example or the filmmaking example, right? Everyone can just say, hey, I run 30 feet towards that enemy and that's my movement done. But let me ask you this, in any anime or movie or television show that you love, that movement, that, that moment of someone charging another character is often broken into little individual shots, little individual moments that are really, really interesting. Um, and this is a really great way to think about description, is breaking these moments into smaller little things. So for example, you could say, I'm going to move 30 feet towards an enemy and engage them in melee combat. or you could go, my character grits their teeth. Cut to, for example, in a movie, that would be cut to the character, you know, kind of gritting their teeth. Then they grind their foot into the dirt in preparation. You know, cut to the foot kind of pushing the dirt around as they kind of begin that back foot getting ready to move. And then my character explodes forward, charging 30 feet towards the enemy and engaging them in melee combat. All I did there was take the small little things that you would see in a movie and break them into descriptive moments that allows that moment of you moving 30 feet to have a lot more depth, to have a lot more feel to it. So thinking about you know, what your character would do in that moment, how the movement would look. You know, are you like, for example, narrow toe running with your arms flapping behind you? Are you Tom Cruise sprinting towards the other character? Are you diving side to side to dodge attacks to, as you move towards them and trying to dodge oncoming, you know, ranged attacks, making yourself hard to hit? Thinking about logically, how would your character move in that moment? Instead of just saying they move, 
How do they move? What does it look like? And how does it work? Uh, Matt, do you want to add anything to the, the anime example to start off with? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things within this realistic descriptions because as a DM, it gives you the opportunity to again give the agency to your players. So mm. player says to you, I'm going to move 30 feet. Just ask them the question, simple. Um, and it gives them a chance to have that shining moment. I always use spells as the, the best example here. Um, I don't I don't think we noted. No, we, we'll, we'll talk about that now. We'll talk about spells now. Um, because spells is the easiest way, casting spells is the easiest way for a player to introduce their own flavour into your game and really give their character their own style. Um, style. So when a player... Love yeah. that. Love that, Matt. So when a, when a player casts whatever spell it is, could be fireball, we could go boring, or um, I think one of the favourites in the current Multi Magic campaign is Chromatic Orb, for example. Now we've got a Clockwork Soul Sorcerer within there, so all of their arcane abilities is around gears and cogs and that clockwork effect. So whenever they cast any spell, it's that flavour that comes through and that's how they describe it. Okay, so I hold out my hand and these, this sphere of gears appears that starts to crackle with lightning energy as I cast Chromatic Orb and use the lightning uh, capability of that and I'm going to throw that. Um, and even little features within that as well. So when using sorcery points to do things like twin spells, what does that look like? And try and encourage that out of your, your players and then build on it. So once they've given you that description, replay that back to them and add in your little DM flavors as well to make it uh, enhance it even more because that just makes things more and more immersive and it makes them feel like they are actually part of this encounter and really in depth into it as well. It's one of my favorite parts of any combat encounter is that adding flavor to it. Totally. And I would say this, guys, the rule and a great rule for this, and me and Matt spoke about this just before we started yeah, this, we did. is the rule is describe the action, the spell, the feature, or whatever it is, before you tell the GM what action, spell, or feature you're using. So for example, you go, you know, my character in the Morton Magic campaign is a shadow sorcerer. So I often go, as you see everything darken, as Edgeus pulls shadow from nearby things, and he begins forming a, you know, flaming sphere in his hand, which he then fucking hurls with all his force as he wails a high pitch rock-like scream as he throws it. That is my flavor. And then I go, oh, by the way, Matt, I'm casting Chromatic Orb at third level. Um, you know, and that is how you do it. For example, I'm going to punch this person. So you're thinking in my head, I'm going to do an unarmed strike. You're like, cool. My character takes a little sidestep in front of the enemy. Uh, he throws a little feint with his left hook and then wails on this dude with a right hook. Matt, I'm doing an unarmed strike. That is an awesome way to do this. Always go with your description first and then what the action is because it will force you to go, how am I doing that action? And that is super, super awesome and super important. Uh, Tiger Bacon saying spells have verbal, somatic and material components noted, which is also helpful in these description moments if you're struggling to come up with a style and flavor for your character. Totally. You can also change the style and flavor of your character as you go, but also that's something that you can develop as a campaign goes as well. So don't feel afraid to try things out, experience that kind of new, you know, facet of the game, basically. So that is what we're going to call the anime example of description before that, and then thinking about breaking things into these little shots, these little like awesome moments of like, you know, I wind up and as I do, the camera zooms in on my fist and then I punch him, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, give that little bit of extra as speed lines go flying past my fist as I clock him in the face, you know, that kind of stuff. Super dope, love it. The next thing that I wanna quickly dive into is, this is a freaking combat game. When we're being honest, D&D &D is a game that is centered around combat. There's a reason why there's a thousand mechanics for combat and like three mechanics for role play. Like it is inherently designed to be a game that involves a, a large amount of combat. And this is something that I am very lucky to have had a lot of experience in. I've done martial arts my whole life. 
I've watched martial arts my whole life. I personally love the art of fighting and the art of human chess as you're trying to understand your opponent and your enemy and trying to work them out, basically. So what I would say is, if you are not proficient in understanding, for example, martial arts or, uh, or weapons fighting or things like that, and you say, for example, you know, I want to be a samurai, well, then maybe you should go research kendo, which is the martial arts that samurais use, and research how they do that. What are the strikes called? What are the different slashes and techniques that they use? What are they called? How do they work? What's it look like? Check out YouTube videos. Again, you can look up anything from weapons to unarmed stuff. Everything from like, you know, spear usage to like, you know, martial, uh, like Muay Thai, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, wrestling, you know, all these different avenues that you can do research. And if you've got a character that you want to flavor in a certain way, I truly, 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 truly recommend doing some research into a martial art you feel would suit your character and their style. Now, this does work for spellcasting as well. And a great, great example of spellcasting martial arts is in Avatar The Last Airbender. When they are doing their various bending stuff, you'll notice that they all have very different styles. And though they have styled them after different types of kung fu in the show, I would speculate that actually the styles suit very different martial arts. So for example, when airbenders are doing their airbending, that is very kung fu. It's a lot of one leg up, a lot of striking poses, a lot of moving it around them, things like that. Firebenders are using elbows, they're using fists, punches, kicks. That's Muay Thai, that's kickboxing. You know, earthbenders are using wide stances. Ha, ha, bo, 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 and it's all very like positional. That is karate, that is literally karate. You know, you look at things like, um, and then uh, water bending, for example. Water bending is very much almost like a Tai Chi. It's very slow and like graceful and elegant and things like that. So again, within your spell casting to give yourself style, Maybe look into a martial art that you're like, when I cast spells, I do a very like a boxing like style. Boom, 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 boom. You know, that kind of thing. Or is it gonna be something where you're throwing kicks and it's like, I'm doing a Muay Thai style that has these kicks. I'm clenching you and throwing my spells close range and all this kind of stuff. Consider all of that and, and put all of that together when you're thinking about your spell casting as well as your martial attacks um, and, and in that space. Matt, do you have anything you want to you wanna add to that? Yeah, because I think you can take that further. Um, yeah. It's not just around your attacks, your spells. It's around your character at the end of the day. Um, so I put the example of the bard there in the chat, but there was also another example there uh, from Maven around the stout halfling rogue. Okay, mm -hmm. they're a rogue. What does that mean for them? How are they? How do they portray their roguish uh, abilities? And if you've got something in mind, go and research that particular element. So I use the example with the bard there, what instrument do they play? If I'm going to role play that, I need to understand that instrument in a basic level. You don't need to be then bloody grade five flutist or whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. But you need to understand the basic instrument, uh, basic mechanics of how a flute works. Um, are you going to be more of an eloquent speaker? Right? How is that going to play out? How, what does that mean? How does that work? How do I portray that as my player uh, and as my character? Sorry. So that research into combat into spell casting can extend beyond just into how do i ultimately flavor my entire character around this concept i've got totally i fully agree and guys bit of research never hurt anybody never hurt anybody it's a good shout right the next thing we want to talk about is movement and role play every turn of combat now someone asked earlier should you break the six second rule um, in a combat round to possibly do role play and things like that. Um, I would say, fuck yeah, of course you fucking should. If you want to role play, break the six second rule. Definitely. Like, dear God, there's like this game, like 90% of the time we're breaking rules in the game anyway. So you might as well break the six second rule as well. So here's my two bits of advice about that. First of all, the reason I say move every single turn of combat is because if you watch any fight, whether it's two dudes with swords, two dudes with spears, two dudes boxing, two guys doing Muay Thai, two guys doing wrestling, no one stands still in front of each other 
for more than a second. That is not realistic. No one stands in one place because you're going to get hit. You are going to get hit. You're too predictable. You're way too predictable. So, I'm not talking about dash away, come back, dash away, come back, dash away, come back. I'm talking about possibly, you could do that. That definitely works. It could be moving from different character to character. I fully think that works as well in terms of moving every turn. But I would speculate there's two types of movement that one is role play and one is actually moving your character every turn. You can describe what is known as the bounce, basically. And this is a martial arts kind of thing. You'll see boxers kind of have this kind of rock that they do. You'll notice karate practitioners will bounce on their feet. Muay Thai people bounce their front leg up and down like this. You'll see wrestlers will tap the ground and be doing feints and things like this. You can role play your character, even though you're stood still on the battle map, you can role play your character moving in a way that would be realistic to a fight. So you can say, you know, I throw my attack and then I come back to my bouncing, I hit the rhythm. I come back to the rhythmic moment of the fight so that I can be quick. Exactly. Drake with a beautiful post in the chat there. Exactly. And thinking about like, okay, cool. I'm back to now just moving and trying to assess, are you going to come and attack me? Am I ready to dodge you? Am I ready to do this? That is such a powerful tool and makes it so immersive for you and your GM. If you're like, bam, I hit you, come back, bounce. And the GM's like, oh shit, this person's like real. Like this is some real shit. And the GM will then be like, and they take a wide stance and you can see them like getting ready to come at you. They're like fainting, you know, throwing little pump fakes at you to get you off of your like kind of stance. That's a super great one. Now the second one I would speculate is this one. So imagine this is a dot, this is a, this is a person on a battle map and say you're within what people know as either reach or threatened range. This is when you are close enough to them that you are not uh, invoking or provoking an opportunity attack by moving out of their range, basically. You can circle them. Move around this threatened range. Circle the person. In martial arts fight, you'll see someone in the center of the ring as someone else will be circling, trying to go to their off hand, trying to move to the hand that they think they're not as strong with, trying to work out a weakness, trying to faint left, faint right. So maybe you'll take a five feet step that way, then a five feet step back, then a five feet step this way. You can use that movement even if you want to stay in range because you're flanking as a rogue and you want to have your sneak attack, because you're a barbarian and you want to be tanking the damage, because you're the fighter and you want to be tanking the damage and doing lots of damage, dealing out high levels of damage. Cool. Move around them. Circle around them. It will force the person who's flanking to circle with you. And then you guys are circling and it becomes a dance which is what fighting is. It's a game of chess that's played on the feet or on the ground and you're moving constantly. Absolutely big, big, big one that I, I and I, I, I put a hard line for myself. Matt has seen me do this in combat. I never, never, ever, ever do a round of combat where I don't move and I don't say something. And that is my like self rule. Matt, do you want to mention anything about the movement every round? Yeah, I think it's because uh, we focused almost quite on the that threatened range. If you want, mm. um, you want to make any combat encounter more immersive. Use the terrain. Don't just be that group of players that sees the enemy and just like, okay, we're all going to crowd here. There will be trees, rocks, elevation points, bits where you can hide. There's rules such as cover and half cover for a reason. Use the terrain. Move around. Don't just stand where you've been placed on that battle map to then go, yeah, I'm just going to, if you're a ranger, for example, I'm just going to stand there and fire all my arrows. No archer does that. They're always running up and down the battlements trying to find the best shot. How can I get that optimum point to catch the liver so I don't necessarily kill them, but I incapacitate them? Or I want to go direct between the eyes. How am I going to get that line of, uh, line of sight to do that? So, yes, absolutely move every turn. It doesn't even have to be that all of your movement just move somewhere to do something it might even and this comment has come out in there in chat as well that movement could open up an option for somebody else to do something and that's going to lead into what we're talking around next as well totally um i love uh celtic saying even things that specifically reduce your movement to zero can be described in that way i have a rogue that uses steady aim feature and i usually describe it as something like mave takes a knee and levels her crossbow uh taking careful aim before releasing the bolt Beautiful Celtic. 
That is some real shit right there, Celtic. That is awesome. I love, love, love where your head's at with that. I love the the, the way that you're thinking about that and the, the angle of description that you're going. That is super, super, super great. Um, and yes, you can go non-lethal with your attacks. That's something that very few people do. You can try and maim. There's kneecapping. There's a reason we have kneecapping in the world. Uh, you know, the, and again, there's Again, martial arts techniques that are used to maim as opposed to like kill or, or do severe damage. You know, there is a, a, something called an oblique kick where you stand sideways, you kick sideways into the side of someone's knee. It's either called a knee stomp or an oblique kick. You hyperextend their knee in hopes that you tear their ACL or MCL and then they have one leg that they can't use. That is a super common technique that is used throughout martial arts and is freaking brutal it's so so brutal you know so that is definitely something um i would i would think about cool the next thing is the role play and the 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 level of like uh i guess dialogue each round i kind of di and dialogue doesn't always have to be words it can be physical movements gestures things like that that can invoke a similar kind of thing within rp but something that's super important to me is if you've watched any anime or things like, for example, James Bond or Mission Impossible, anime, they literally stop to monologue to each other in the middle of combat and tell, I've been waiting this whole time. You killed my father and I have tracked you down to this very moment so that I could kill you in the same way that you killed him. You know, cool. If your player is an anime character, you love that style, give them a monologue here and there for sure. Your GM won't fucking hate it, or he will cut you off and be like, cool, continue the monologue next round. Um, absolutely love that. Um, super, super great one. The other one is in James Bond and Mission Impossible. They'll be in their earpiece like, he's running. Oh, or do move left, flank. Oh, did you have a clear shot? Can, oh, can I move around this way? Communicate with your team. Shit. You've got a group of people around you as if you wouldn't be communicating with each other so that you know what's happening. Even if with hand gestures, you know, the old, look over there, stop, you know, go, 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 all okay, you know, all this kind of stuff. Hand gestures, super, super great to describe as well. As you turn to another player and you're like, go, 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 you know, kind of thing. That allows you guys to have this cohesion between, uh, you know, your, uh, your team and things like that. Now, the final two things that I, I, I want to mention within that are shit talking. How often do we see in movies one fighter being like, oh, yeah? Well, I'm bigger and better than you, so come step up, big boy. You know, or like, I'm about to fucking pummel you, and like, I'm about to pummel you into the ground. You're gonna feel my the force, the full force of my dragon punch. You know, shit talking is like a common thing in fighting situations. You know, so why not shit talk your opponent a little bit? Be like, mate, you missed. You suck, fam. That was a terrible punch. I'm about to show you how to really throw a punch. Do some shit talking. That's awesome. And then a classic one. This is one that I love. And it's, it's, it's one that had so much gravitas that it's become a meme on the internet and is something that I absolutely love. There's a scene in one of the Mission Impossible movies where Henry Cavill um, does a little, uh, 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 what I call the, the cocking of his fist. It was him shaking out his fist in the moment, which fighters do all the time. They're like tensed up because they're like trying to fight and they need to release some of that tension. But he does a little uh-uh, a little uh-uh, like cocking his fist. People have since turned that into a meme and it's become this whole thing. But that moment added, there we go, yep, exactly. And it added this level of like intrigue to his character. It kind of showed, oh, he's a bit of a badass. This uh, uh, really showed him into like, oh shit, he's a badass. So even something as small as that can add so much immersion, so much depth to your character in the combat. So the two points are move, and freaking, in some way, RP, whether it's communicate with your team, shit talk a bad guy, give hand signals to someone, or even just do the Henry Cavill, uh -uh, you know, to get yourself, uh, you know, into the moment and try and intimidate your, your enemy. Those are awesome, awesome ways that you can do that. Matt, go for it. I know you're, you're, you got something on the tip of your tongue. I was just going to, I mean, I called it out in chat already, but mm. those little things you do will often provoke the DM to say, okay, you're going to cock your fist, make me an intimidation check. Those skills that are in the middle of your character sheet are not just for out of 
uh, sort of or role playing situations, they can be great during combat as well. You want to go try and launch yourself off a tree? Make me an acrobatics check. Make me an athletics check. Um, those skills can be really, really handy in combat to change the dynamic of a situation as well. Enemies just about to bear down on one of your party members and deliver the final blow. Okay, I'm going to distract them. I'm going to intimidate them. And that might prevent that killing blow from coming down. It might save somebody or it might just change the whole combat counter, uh, encounter itself. So don't, don't forget to use them as well. Totally, totally agree. 100%. Awesome. That kind of concludes possibly like the, the one of the more simple ways that you can enhance your combat. So move every round, RP every round. Have fun with it. It's super, super, super great time. Next one is a super, super fun one. This is player team up moves. So <laughs> the ready action and the help action in combat are some of the most unused things that exist in D&D. Me and Matt were talking about this earlier. It's so rare that people use ready actions and that people, um, you know, then consider using a help action to assist a player. Drake just posted a really nice little clip there of, uh, of someone throwing, uh, throwing Wolverine. And that's exactly what we're talking about. These team up moments where you can, you know, use one person to do something. It might be two people combining spells. It might be whatever, it, you know, that kind of leads to. And personally, I'm such a huge fan of team up moments. Um, they, they create epic scenarios, whether it's a fail or a success, it always ends up being epic in whatever manner uh, you go about that. So, you know, and I'm talking about things like, for example, think about the fight between the Avengers and Ultron during uh, Avengers Age of Ultron. I'm thinking like during the Incredibles movie, when the Incredibles are teaming up to fight the giant robots at the end. I'm thinking Mr. and Mrs. Smith when they go back to back in the final scene um, in the warehouse and are shooting all those dudes. Um, if you guys have any other pop culture team up moments that you love, please drop them in the chat. I'd love to be privy to some more of those because I was you know, kind of coming up with some of those uh, a, a, as I was writing this. I'd love to hear if you have any pop culture team up moments that you always loved and thought were super, super cool. Um, Matt, do you want to talk about ready actions and some of that? Because I know you 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 are a big advocate for this, a huge, huge advocate. Yeah, for absolutely. This. So it's it's something I actually encourage my players to do quite often is think around not just what you can do, but also what you can do to help others. Uh, and the Mortal Magic guys are brilliant at doing this now. We've got to a stage where they will not just think around, okay, I could fire this spell and do this, but if I do this that opens up this player to go and hit even harder or do something like that um so this idea of readying an action i am going to wait until jewel jumps out of that tree with her blades drawn for me to then cast the spell which is going to distract them and hopefully give her advantage on a strike or something like that uh, again it's going to fuel the dm's brain for additional thoughts um, and that's just ready in action. The help action for me is probably one of the things that goes totally glossed over all the time. That is where you can truly think, right, I'm going to take the help action and I'm going to pick Gimli up by his beard and I'm going to throw him across this bridge with his axe out so he can then go and make a, a melee strike against those enemies. Um, and it's, it's just an element of combat that often gets forgotten because they're two things that on the face of it, why would I, well, okay, help, I'm going to go pick them up off the floor. That's a common example we see in some of the more recent video games in terms of how a help action is described, but it's very limited in the way it's portrayed. So be creative with it. You want to ready an action? Okay, why do you want to ready that action? What's it going to do? Is it just because you're waiting for an enemy to move or are you going to help your team out in some way as well? Mm. I fully agree with you, dude. And by you doing this, guys, by you readying an action or choosing a help action, Again, it forces that RP moment of communicating as a team, going, hey, you know, the classic Lord of the Rings one, as Tom and, as Tom and Matt mentioned earlier, the, the, what if you toss me? Toss you? What do you well, just, just, just toss me. Go on, toss me. But don't tell the elf. And Aragorn's like, okay. You know, kind of thing. It forces that RP communication, and you create epic moments that are remembered by your party forever because, oh, so and so, we combined your scorching ray and my, you know, uh, lightning bolt into some crazy spell that was super powerful. And the GM actually gave us each an extra damage die on our, on our roll, which was so, so awesome and like granted us even more um, stuff. So 
it really forces you guys to communicate and forces you guys into a place of working together and thinking about how as a team you can do this uh, as a unit as, a, as opposed to just often being, you know, which I think we all do, and I do it as well, being like, what can my character do? And like, what it, like this This is very specific, do you know what I mean? And uh, and yeah, that's that's a super important one. Mad Maven saying, you know, I, I was three weeks in and I, they tried to explain the help action to me and I just, well, I wasn't understanding it enough and, and things like that. That's okay, Mad Maven, you're gonna get better at this. Like I said to Drake, practice, practice, try another help action. If you get it wrong again, try it again, try it again, try it again. And eventually you'll get it right, and then you'll know how to get it right going forward, and it will be fine. Um, you'll gain the confidence to do it more frequently and all that kind of stuff. So don't feel deterred by the fact that you maybe struggle to understand it or you're not sure. Try your best. So be like, hey, I'm doing this. Um, can that be a help action? You know, and, and you'll be surprised how often your GM will be like, yeah, actually, go for it. Yeah, I can see how that's helping. Go for it. That's That sounds great to me, you know? Um, it's, it's it's a really, really good space to play in. And Matt makes a really good point in the chat. They're saying it allows you to play with the initiative order when it might not favor the team uh, to move you uh, to move you wanted to uh, to the move you wanted to do. My apologies. Reading. Blech. That's all good. It's, it's getting late now, mate. Sure <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's eyes are probably getting a bit tired as well. But no, yeah, no, it's exactly that. Right. Initiative order is there. It's something we work with just to define who goes when, but it doesn't have to be the be all and end all of your, your turn. So use yeah. those those types of actions, ready in action, help action to play around with that a little bit. Um, I think one of the examples I've got of that is the idea of holy weapon as a spell. Uh -huh. uh, and you're in a fight with demons and you're not doing enough damage because you've not got a magic weapon okay i'm going to hold my action and give the wink to the cleric to uh -huh. cast what i think he knows i want him to cast cast holy yeah. weapon boom then i'm going to strike and then i can start to be more effective beautiful love that super great point super super great point um so yeah does anyone else have any questions or anything like that that they would like to drop in the chat before we move on to like the next thing the conclusion is team up always epic even if you fail is is my conclusion uh the reason it's uh it's a reason why bards are buff casters 100 percent. why they're given bardic inspiration and doing all that kind of stuff fully agree with you drake 100 percent um, anyone else got any little bits they want to chime in it, chime in with about that? Awesome sauce. It's looking like we're all good. Ooh. Everyone seems to be happy. Banging. Right. Okay. Let's uh, let's run through these next two nice and quickly. Then we'll use the last one as it's probably one of the most important ones, and then we will round this out, guys. We're right at the end here. Thank you for everyone who stuck around. We really really appreciate it. Um, so. Think, uh, GMs can often also think of a group of enemies like a party of players. In of that, they can all have different roles. So this is, this is enemies having different roles on the battlefield. So what I would say is stick to roles that you understand and roles that you know if you're a GM. So for example, things like uh, common ones that we know are like tank, uh, range fighter, uh, healer, um, you know, DPS. You know, all these kinds of things that, that are common terminology that we, we seem to be, uh, you know, aware about. But if you're not, a little bit of research about that will definitely help you out. But again, it adds this dynamic that then you have one dude who's charging at your players. You have one guy who's staying back and shooting off healing spells. You have a person next to them who's protecting them and shooting off bow and arrows, uh, shooting off arrows or crossbow bolts, you know, towards uh, the enemy and protecting the healer. You have a fighter who is flanking with the the tank to cause you guys more trouble um, in in that situation and gaining advantage for the enemies so using your enemies as like a, a party of players is a very great tool that you can use um, to to kind of tackle some of that stuff for sure um, Matt do you, do you want to talk about that as well because you had a nice little point about that before we dove into this yeah, so I think it's it's a way for you to start thinking around how the interactions between those um, those creatures will work as well. And then um, I'll call out the Cobalt Press for this, um, because sometimes it can be hard to find examples of those creatures to actually work with this. What the Cobalt Press do really, really well is create these class of creatures or monsters, if you like, in their various manuals and then create the different types. So they've got a version of Ghoul, for example, called the Dara Ghoul. And there will be casters, there will be tanks, there will be the cleric sort. Um, and you can then play around with that. 
Um, I think the thing I spoke around and we were speaking around earlier is actually more around how we can speed some of those things up as well within that that party of um, breaches, if you like. So when there are things like initiative roles, roll for a group, when there are saves being made, if it's all the same type of monster, creature, make a group save as well. Because it means you're not, as a DM, slowing things down by going, okay, I've got four monsters, creatures here. One roll, two roll, three roll, four roll. Now, if you wish to do that, fine. There's no problem with doing that. But my recommendation to really speed things up and keep people's attention high is to do those group roles with those creatures as well. So by all means, give them their individual personalities during the fight and they can have their own turns. But in those moments where you can speed things up by making those group roles, do so because it rapidly it will uh, just increase the speed and will move things on at a much faster pace fully fully agree yeah yeah um you know and and this leads nicely into the thing we're about to work which is speeding up combat and making combat yeah. run a little bit faster um you know group monster group all of your monsters into one initiative uh doing group saves like matt just said and then something that is a classic one is taking the average damage instead of rolling uh, plus the modifier and varying that slightly every single round um, so that people uh, feel like, you know, they're they're getting uh, a good range of damage, but also it speeds things up, keeps it fresh, keeps it quick, keeps it, uh, you know, flowing, basically. So think of enemies sometimes in roles, as well as also think of, um, you know, how you can speed up combat in terms of grouping monsters for saves for initiative and also taking damage instead of as a GM, constantly fucking rolling dice which can become you know labor intensive for both the players and yourself um when you're doing that for sure <coughs> oh excuse me my goodness um cool and with that we have come to our very last point of the workshop guys um it's considered meta knowledge if i know the hp of so is it considered meta knowledge if i know the hp of something i have to fight um no, I mean, yes, to a degree, Mad Maven, in, in of that, like, yes, they, like, it is, yes, you are doing meta thinking, yes. If you know the HP and you're taking that into consideration while you're fighting a creature, yes. I guarantee you, though, every GM you ever play with will be adjusting HP either on the fly or they will have adjusted it at the beginning of their encounter creation so that it's not something their players can guess. That is, like, a common... Uh, misconception or, or or like truth of GMs is we are often like going, oh, cool, cool, cool. Like I, I know that, you know, for example, a bugbear has, I don't know, 47 HP. Wonderful. He'll start with 47 HP. But if you guys whop him in one round, I'm going to give him an extra 10 or 20 HP so that he does it so that this combat encounter doesn't feel like you just ran through this guy. In the same breath of if he's beating the shit out of you guys, I might drop his HP a little bit so that the next couple of hits actually take him out a little bit sooner so that it suits the, the narrative and the story and things like that. Now, that's a common thing done by GMs. A lot of, some people absolutely hate that. Some people truly stand against it and want to play the game for what it is. But those people will then often adjust those HP totals before the encounter so that you can't guess what that number is. That's a super, super common one. I hope that answered that question. And look, meta thinking is not always bad. It's not always bad. Like it can sometimes be, you know, beneficial to, to think meta sometimes as well. I, I, would, I would definitely say that for sure. Um, I do this to avoid DMPCs getting, kill, uh, getting killing blows, 100%. The DM NPC is about to rinse through a bad guy. You definitely, uh, you definitely want to, uh, to to hand that back to the players and give them a chance to shine, as Matt just said in the chat. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Right, guys. We have made it. All you amazing people have stuck around for coming up to four hours now, which is insane. Um, we really, first of all, really appreciate it, and thank you guys so much. But the last point that we have is post combat consequences and this is super 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 important this is one that is super super valuable and a tool that gms can use uh, very sparingly or all the freaking time if they so please now this is a great way to make your party of mur murder hobos consider their actions very very quickly 
This involves using um, uh, a lot of stuff about, um, you know, um, uh, essentially the whole every action has an equal reaction. Your world is a living organism and a living entity. When your players kill something in a region or battle a person or do this, that will ripple to that person's or that creature's circle of things that it touches within the, the life that is nearby it and, and the stuff that is around it. So you have to consider what the actions your players took are and how that has affected the world around them because that is massive. And this could be something as small as, for example, you go into a dungeon and clear out a colony of spiders. They now become extinct in the area and that's it. Cool, spider's gone, that's it. Or it could be something as catastrophic as killing a king, which starts a power struggle across a continent that causes ripples of injustice, unlawful and unorganized events to happen across the entire continent. So these effects can really determine how the world kind of plays out. You know, I, I have a great example of my players did a heist where they thought they were helping the people of this city by uh, retrieving water that was being kept from the people. But one of the ways that they were able to pull off this heist was by causing a distraction that was in the form of a riot. This riot ended up spreading so bad while they were doing this heist that it actually caused the oppressive government that ran the city to implement curfews, to perform public executions of people that ran the riots and things like that. It caused a whole ripple that turned this whole city into an absolute shit show because of the decisions that my players made. Even though they successfully pulled off the heist, they stole the water, they did everything right, but because they started a riot, it fucked everything up across the city for many, many NPCs. Super, super valuable thing that you can use as a GM to put in those kind of moral questions. It's one of my favorite things to do. I love making players think that they've succeeded in a combat encounter, but really then the effects of that combat encounter are super negative and, and have caused really like wild things to happen in the world uh, because it really does make your players think, wow, should we just fight everything that comes our way? Serious, serious one to consider. Matt, I, I know you, you love you love a good, uh, good post-consequence from season one of Morton Magic through to season two of everything that happened to my character. The reason my character exists in, in our game is consequences of season one actions of players. Go for it. And I always like to take those consequences forward as well. I have, my biggest example actually sits outside of combat. It's the reward at the end of combat as well. Mm -hmm. um, giving a player a choice between one weapon or another as their reward. And this was to stop this particular party just being that group that collects every single magic item they possibly can. So I started to put some serious consequences about it. If you take mm -hmm. this weapon, there is a consequence that comes with it. Uh, the player picked up that weapon. Lo and behold, that was a weapon that belonged to one of the Archdevils of the Hells, and they were now bound to that Archdevil. Not only that, it then kicked on the next part of the, the homebrew story as well. And I use that as a moment to say, okay, you've picked that weapon up. You've actually unleashed an evil now, and you don't realize this at that point. Big glowing glyph in the sky, big purple thing, and they walk out thinking, yes, I've got myself a new hammer. Then they look up and go what the fuck is that and what did we just do um so i love doing this i also love dropping these in and this is something i got from a bringer iongar is you finish a session and everybody thinks great we accomplished something awesome here and then you cut to a totally different scene at the end of your session and do like an epilogue this is what's happened as a result of what you've just done you don't know this right now but this is what's going on right now and that starts them thinking anyway without the players being directly affected in that moment. Uh, and we've done that a couple of times in, in Modern Magic now. And I find that a really, really effective method of making things more immersive, but also uh, at the same time delivering, that, delivering those consequences. Do you know what, Matt? I, I, I'm, I'm such a huge advocate of that as well. You know, one of my favorite moments was post this riot, uh, the, the party didn't tell the Mafia Don that they were working with to, to perform this heist that there was likely a group of uh, imperialist guards coming to raid his he his headquarters, the Mafia headquarters. Because of this, the Don was captured and killed. He was executed publicly by, by someone. And 
what I, I did the exact same thing. They leave the island. They're like, "Woo, we did it!" Um, and I then cut to you know the Don being killed publicly and and how much this caused issues. And our players were just like, "Oh fuck, man! Like we did so bad." And guys, truthfully, this is something that I think again often gets overlooked. And Matt, I, I'm so glad you touched on this because we didn't actually have it in our notes. But I'm so glad you you touched on this because this isn't really combat stuff. It's more like storytelling stuff. No movie ever, no anime ever, no TV show ever doesn't show what the bad guys are doing. That's not a thing. You always see what the bad guys are doing. We cut away from the good guys to see what the bad guys are doing, to see what's happening in the BBEG's life, what evil plot they're kind of growing into and, and growing to. That is one of the greatest tools that you can use to keep players engaged and to keep them on their toes, uh, keep them you know, on the edge of their seats, is cutting to what is happening with the BBEG, what is happening with the bad guy of this moment, what their actions caused and the bad guy to do. Because I, I very much like to have what, what I know my player's timeline is, and I'll write this out, I'll have you know, each session, what they've done, and then what I think is gonna happen next session and I'll write that out every single session. As well as that, I also then have what the BBGs are doing in, in concurrent, like almost like periodically, and they might be related to what the players have done. It might be completely nothing to do with what the players have done because they're so far away from each other at this point that they're not even aware of one another in this moment. But either way, it's good to know what's happening, what the bad guy's doing. And cutting to that and having a little scene as a GM where you can role play that moment and be like, you know, this is super sick. This is going to happen, you know, and, and this, the, you know, I've had one where the bad guy is creating a monstrosity flesh golem out of various different pieces. And they're like, yes, it's finally ready. My players are like, what the fuck is that about? What's he making that for? We've never touched on it again. And I know when it's going to come up but we're not gonna touch on it until then. But still in the back of their minds, they're wondering, what the fuck was that flesh golem scene about? Why, why, why did he show us that? I didn't, why did we need to know that? And that is such a powerful tool to use in your arsenal of, of showing what the BBG or the bad guys are doing. I love that one so, so much. I'm so glad you brought that up, Matt. I'm so, so glad you brought that up. Why is this called? Um, right, holy shit. Did we just do it? Did, did, did we make it? We did. We made it, folks. Oh my good, sweet, golly gee williker. Um, we have made it, everyone. We have made it to the end of our, uh, of our incredible first workshop. And the only reason it was incredible is because of you amazing people that came in and hung out with me and Matt tonight, spent the time talking with us, and, uh, and hanging out with us and doing all that amazing stuff, sharing your creative ideas, working in those groups together and all that amazing stuff. We hope that you learned something from the shit that Matt and I spoke about uh, at length. We hope that you guys learned some things. We hope you learned some stuff from each other. I learned from you guys tonight. I'm a better dungeon master because of some of the shit that you guys brought to light tonight and, and spoke about. So thank you guys for enriching my GM experience and everything. Um, that I am going to be doing going forward. I appreciate you all infinitely and cannot tell you how much this was an amazing experience for me. Um, I have just dropped our jot form in the thing. If you could please fill that out. Um, it's completely anonymous. It just gives us some feedback about these of how we can do better for you guys and continue making this a unique experience for you guys that is tailored to what you guys want because that's what we want to do at Homie and the Dude. We're, we're all about making this super specific and amazing to you guys. Um, for anyone who uh, who has missed this or his, you know, is coming late or anything like that, this will be the full four hour recording will be on YouTube in the next two days probably. I'm also about to link as well. I'm just going to drop a WeTransfer link that has the uh, that quickly has the um, the handouts that we are going to be giving you guys that talks about all the stuff that we have talked about today. You have them in PDF form and you also have them in photo form. So I'll get you guys that link as well, which means that you have every single little bit of, uh, of stuff that we've gone over today. Um, it is all in there for you guys. It's quick, easy to access. I've refined all the notes down so you should be able to just look through it. Super, super easy. 
But I want to just say from my half, um, I've been Bodhi, the unexceptional dungeon master, and I have been blessed by you amazing people tonight and anyone who comes to any future workshops. I didn't know I, if I was going to enjoy this or if this was going to be something that, you know, I was going to want to do more of or anything like that. I can tell you right now, I'm locked in. I will definitely be doing more of these workshops. I was so hyped to engage in this with you guys and spend this time with you. You guys made my night. You, you guys maybe made my week. You guys maybe made my fucking month and it's my birthday next week. You know, you guys, you guys took it to a whole new level tonight. So pat on the back to everyone else who was a part of this and who took the time out of the day to listen to me and Matt. Um, final thing I'll say for homie and the dude and then Matt, I'll pass it over to you. Um, we have some amazing things that we've created. We have our Sky Zephyrs. Kickstarter, which is all about vehicle combat in D&D 5e done right. So we have everything from airships to spaceships to Mad Max vehicles, subnautical, sea vessels, all that kind of stuff. It's a huge supplement um, and it is being released very, very soon. Um, you can pre-order that PDF or hardcover at the moment through the Homie and the Dude website. Um, as well as that, um, we are working on our next Kickstarter at the moment, which is The Wandering Tavern, a Studio Ghibli-inspired floating airship city that is uh, traveling through the skies at all times and never docks. And we're so, so hyped uh, to bring that to you guys very, very soon. The final two things that I would like to promote, and I hope you guys will give me the space to do so. The first one is, um, please, guys, go check out Molten Magic. Matt is one of the best fucking dungeon masters I have ever encountered. He keeps me on the edge of my seat every fucking session. He makes me want to cry. He makes me want to laugh. He makes me angry. He makes me happy. He does all the amazing things a GM should do. And I am blessed and honored to be part of that campaign over at Morton Magic. And boy, oh boy, is the story incredible. The second thing I would like to promote is the Homie and the Dude YouTube channel. Over there, you will find our actual play where you can see me grow as a dungeon master from when I very first started running my homebrew world all the way through to now where I am a lot more proficient in what I'm doing, as well as also the thing that I am most proud of, which is our Avatar The Last Airbender series. It's four episodes ranging at about an hour and a half each where we tell the story of the inciting incident of the Hundred Year War. Essentially, if you know the world, that is the massacres, uh, the massacres across the air temples um, in, the, in, in the Avatar world. It's a super heartfelt story that starts with a wedding and ends with, uh, with some of the saddest stuff I have ever witnessed in a D&D &D or a TTRPG space ever. So please go check all of that out. I would love to hear your feedback. I'd love to know what you guys think of those series and all that kind of stuff. I have been Bodhi, the unexceptional dungeon master. You guys fucking rock. Matt, over to you, my guy. Yeah, thanks, Bodhi. Well, first of all, mate, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, to come and do this with you. It's been an absolute blast. Uh, I've loved speaking to everyone, meeting some new friends here. Uh, love hearing from you all. I, as well, has learned so much tonight just from all the creativity in the room. I have loved all of the creative energy as well. It is amazing. It is, yes, it empowered me again to go and start creating even more stuff. So um, I really appreciate the love as well. Thanks for the plug there, buddy. I've dropped the link to the Twitch channel in the uh, the chat there if anybody's interested. Um, but just a huge shout out to Homie and the Dude as well. Since Bodie and Tom have joined Malta Magic, uh, we have just felt so re-energized uh, and the energy that these guys bring to the game is amazing. So please go and check out all of their streams. Uh, the uh, the um, Avatar series. I almost forgot what it was called then. <laughs> uh, the Avatar series is amazing, and it's one of those ones. A, a lot of DMD campaigns and DV uh, D and D sessions are really, really long, drawn out things. This four part series of the Avatar stuff is just so powerful, but it's not a huge amount of content either, and you can get a D and D fix really quickly. So please, I really do encourage you to check that out, as well as everything else that Home in the Do because it is awesome. But from me, a very heartfelt thank you. Much love to all of you. Um, and I look forward to seeing you hopefully all in the future as well. Amazing. Right, guys. Uh, make sure you fill out that drop form. We want to know what the next workshop should be. We want to follow your guys, uh, what you guys are wanting, and we want to give you guys the stuff. So fill out the next, uh, the next drop form and let us know what you guys want us to do next. 
Matt and I will be back. We're thinking about possibly doing these maybe monthly, maybe bi-monthly, something like that. So we've got a bit of time to prep as we're both very busy people. Um, but otherwise, guys, thank you so fucking much. You guys are the best community ever. La familia till we die, guys. Till we die. Thank you for being in the homie and the dude discord. Engage across the thing. And, uh, and guys, we'll catch you guys in the next workshop. See you then. Bye! Bye, everyone! Bye, 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 bye!